very good evening from author tv and i request dr manish to start sir your live now uh, yeah good evening everyone and i welcome you all to delhi orthopedic association uh, post graduate training program in uh, shoulder so this is series of webinars we have already done uh, three webinars so this is the fourth one and uh, i welcome the uh, uh, expert faculty dr bb basin from he is a senior consultant and a unit head and chief of arthroscopy dr jay maheshwari from max saket he is a, in charge of uh, shoulder uh, dr raman kant agarwal he is senior consultant uh, upper limb surgery uh, from uh, medanta and dr pratik gupta is senior consultant and sports medicine chief in sargangaram hospital dr shashank mishra is a shoulder uh, arthroscopy surgeon at sargangaram hospital dr sumit arora he is a professor in uh, molana azad medical college and i welcome dr sharad agarwal dr uh, professor lalit mani from delhi orthopedic association dr hitesh lal dr dhananjay dr vinit arora so uh, i request dr sharad agarwal to say few words about this webinar thanks dr manish good evening friends i welcome you all to today's post graduate teaching program of delhi orthopedic association today's theme is shoulder my thanks to the learned faculty of shoulder surgeons led by dr maheshwari dr raman kant dr pratik dr shashank and dr sumit for preparing this webinar at such a short notice the webinar includes the basics which post graduates are expected to know besides post graduates i'm sure it shall be a welcome revision for all of us my special thanks to dr manish dr shamshul hoda dr shyam ashok shyam for working hard behind the doors to make do our webinar a huge success thank you Uh, yeah i have to add this webinar is basically uh, supported by uh, ortho tv and dr ashok sham and dr shamshul hida are big support to it without them this would have not been possible so without wasting time we'll go to the first speaker i request dr pratik gupta to speak on history and examination of shoulder joint dr pratik Dr. Manish, is it uh, uh, visible? Yeah, yeah, it is visible, yeah, and yeah. you are audible. You can start, sir. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Manish, uh, Dr. Sharad, and all uh, DOA executive for organizing this uh, wonderful uh, uh, webinar on shoulder. Um, so uh, today, I'll be speaking on history and examination, which is the first basic thing for a PG when he is met with a case of a shoulder uh, during the exam. So if you look at the shoulder it is a complex joint including humerus glenoid scapula clavicle and the soft tissue around so we should not forget the soft tissue uh, because they form the integral part of the shoulder joint now when you taking the history the usual history uh, which is to be taken in any other case uh, i'm not going to go through but some of the points in history that are relevant for shoulder i'll pick it up here like age now once you have the age of the patient we start thinking the thinking process should start that if the patient is less than 30 years of age they are more likely to be encountering traumatic problem instability more and if somebody has 45 age 45 plus so we are going to look at more rotator cuff frozen shoulder and maybe 55 plus degenerative osteoarthritic conditions could be the cause so the moment you have the age you start thinking what could be the probable cause of the problem then also dominant hand if it is involved obviously is much more problematic to the patient and also taking the work and sports history is important to understand how much the problem is affecting in day to day life of the person because this will help us to formulate the treatment for him at a later time and coming to the uh, presenting complaints the chief complaints the chief complaints that uh, we see the patient in our in our centers and our clinics are pain swelling clicking weakness stiffness instability of which pain is the most common thing and it's almost associated with every other pathology like uh, like uh, swelling or stiffness or instability so pain is uh, is what we'll deal in more depth so when we have um, uh, the uh, pain uh, um, in shoulder then we have to Uh, start thinking in the back of our mind uh, that either the pain is coming from the uh, shoulder itself or 
it is coming from somewhere else, what we call as a referred pain. So uh, there you can see the causes of pain uh, coming from the neck, elbow, wrist, diaphragm, cardiac, and sometimes vascular. So you have to exclude them while you're doing your uh, exam and your uh, history. So from history to the exam. And if it is arising from the shoulder proper, then it could be non-traumatic cause, traumatic or others. In others, you have to keep in mind in the back of the mind, it could be an entrapped nerve, it could be six scapular syndrome, could be scapular dyskinesia, uh, osteonecrosis of the head of the humerus. In traumatic, it could be acute or chronic. Again, it could be soft tissue or bony. So all these things have to be kept in the back of the mind and we have to exclude one or the other during our history and examination. Non-traumatic can be further classified into inflammatory, infective, metabolic, malignancy, degenerative, and the reasons of those are mentioned here. So uh, this we'll have to try and uh, segregate while we are doing our uh, history. So what is important first and foremost is history of trauma. The moment we ask history of trauma, then we will ascertain is the trauma significant? If it is so, then it could be a traumatic pathology to soft tissue or bone. So we start thinking in those terms. Then the second common thing to find out is the site of pain. Because as you see, as in the picture also, the moment the site of pain is at the anterior, uh, slightly lateral and superior aspect of the arm, this is where the patient generally uh, uh, holds when uh, there is a problem in shoulder, and especially we have to start thinking in terms of rotator cuff uh, issues. But if the pain was more anterior and coming down towards the front of the arm to the elbow, then we are looking possibly towards the biceps pathology, bicephalic tendonitis and all those. But at the same time, if you see that the pain is at the top of the shoulder, then it is the AC joint area. So it could give us an idea that it is coming from AC joint. So our further history and further examination will go in that direction. Then the type of pain, is it a dull continuous pain? or is a sharp, sudden pain. The dull continuous pain could be rotator cuff pathology, degenerative changes. Sudden sharp pain could be traumatic, uh, especially after this history of trauma. It could be liberal tear, it could be slap tear, things like that. Or is there a tingling sensation, patient complains, and especially if there's radiation, then it is pointing towards the nerve uh, pathology that we have to look at. Also, the severity of pain can sometimes give us an idea. We know that sudden severe pain is uh, common in infl inflammatory pathology like uh, supraspinatus, calcific tendonitis, which is the you know very painful condition where patient is neither able to sit or stand and is in problem. So severity also gives us an idea of which side uh, we have to think about which pathology, which particular part of the shoulder could be uh, giving rise to the patient's problem. Then onset and duration of pain. So how did it start? As I said, was it after trauma? Then it's traumatic. If it's a gradual, deciduous uh, onset at a long duration, then we are looking at rotator cuff, maybe frozen shoulder, uh, rotator cuff pathology. Or if it is um, uh, pain at night, uh, then it is more thinking in terms of it could be rotator cuff or it could be osteonecrosis. So this also gives us an idea which way we have to go. Radiation we talked about. If there's radiation, then we have to look at the neck and the other neurological disorders, which could have caused the nerve-related issues. Then the important thing is aggravating relieving factor as to when the pain becomes uh, worse. So if the patient has pain in abduction of at about 90 to 100 degrees, we know it is because of impingement, possibly rotator cuff tendonitis, which is the cause of problem. But the same pain is at 140 or 160 degrees uh, range, then we are looking at ECJ pathology. So uh, the, the uh, aggravating uh, points can give us the cause of pain. Abduction external rotation possibly could be an instability causing pain. So uh, we get an idea from uh, this as to what pathology and where we are dealing with. Then lastly, we also need to know the progress of the pain. When it started, as it get, it is getting progressively worse, but it's getting better. It's getting better, that means the pathology is settling down. When it's getting worse, that means something is ongoing process. So that also helps us in our thinking process. Similarly for swelling, so all those headings we have to also revise in swelling. How did it start, the course, whether it is associated with stiffness, whether there is fever uh, associated, is there slightest movement causing a problem along the swelling, then we think of infective pathology. 
is associated with pain, slightest movement causing a uh, lot of pain to the, uh, to the uh, patient. Uh, it is bacterial infection would be a, uh, one uh, uh, differential diagnosis. But if it is insidious, on, insidious onset with low grade fever, some loss of weight, we know that this is uh, in, in uh, it could be towards tubercular pathology or a chronic pathology. Inflammatory pathology presents with pain, but not so much of fever, which may be moderate amount. So that also we have to factor in as well as the metabolic causes of swelling. If there is a swelling, needless to say that we also have to do, if there's a localized swelling, the other uh, examination of swelling, which is usual site, size, shape, surface, margin, consistency. So all those things have to be also done if we find swelling, which is localized in and around the shoulder. Then looking at the stiffness, again, uh, how did the stiffness start? The onset, duration, history of trauma. If there is no history of trauma, onset is slow and insidious, then again, we know we are looking at a product of or frozen shoulder kind of a problem. But if there is a history of uh, injury and uh, an acute onset, then uh, we know it's a traumatic cause, most probably rotator cuff, uh, which is causing the issue or any other bony pathology. So same kind of uh, uh, questioning, leading questions have to be asked here. Clicking is another complaint. Now, clicking, again, with the history of injury and sharp sudden click or catch in the shoulder would uh, actually point towards a liberal tear which is giving it. At the same time, if there is a gradual, uh, slow growing pain and uh, uh, along with clicking at the back of the shoulder, uh, we know that it could be a snapping scapula, which could be doing it. So it gives us an idea which side to look at. Micro instability sometimes causes clicking uh, with no history of injury. So that also has to be kept in mind. You have to have high suspicion of um, uh, while we are looking at clicking or all these things. Then the patient may present with a frank instability, and this is more likely for uh, postgraduates to come across because we see quite often in most of the uh, clinics instability, and more than often they are picked up for uh, you know exam because they give a good history. There is a lot of things to see. So when there is history of in, uh, instability, the patient has come. It could be weakness and pain to complete frank dislocation. Here, history of trauma becomes very important. Because we know if there is a significant history of trauma, then we classify that instability into traumatic. If there is no history or there's mild history of trauma, it could be a traumatic instability. And in instability, the index dislocation history is very important. When did it happen first, obviously? And how did it happen? Was it a significant trauma? Did you go to the hospital to get it reduced? It shows that there was definitely a dislocation. And how many dislocations since then is also important to us. It gives you idea of what kind of a pathology we will see in, you know, there will be a, a liberal tear, but what will be the level of uh, tissue if it is 10, 15, 20 dislocations, we know the quality of liberal will be very poor. And also we may encounter the bony erosions also. So we need to investigate in those terms should somebody have 20 dislocation plus. Similarly, the position of discomfort as to what position does the shoulder uh, cause problem to the patient. So typically we know the commonest instability is anterior, and in this place, the patient has problem in abduction, external rotation, overhead, like playing badminton, or sleeping with the arm uh, behind the head. So that's when it becomes uncomfortable, so that's anterior instability, possibly. But at the same time, if the patient complains of pain when they're trying to reach in front and towards the uh, uh, left side of the body or across the body, then it uh, points out toward the posterior labrum uh, pathology. And if the patient has problem holding anything heavy while like a suitcase or, or, or something heavy by the side of the body, then they could point towards the inferior labral pathology. So those uh, things will give us an idea what kind of instability we are looking at. And if the instability is there, then we also need to know, is there the same problem in the other joints? Is there a history of hyperlaxity and they're able to do tricks that they've been showing their friends and uh, being uh, able to do some uh, you know, crazy things with their body. So that will show hyperlaxity, if at all. Then the patient may present as weakness. A weakness, as I said, could also be a sign of instability. But if you look at weakness, then we are looking at more 
of uh, the first thing that comes to mind if there's history of injury and following it as a weakness, then we are looking at a rotator cuff pathology, rotator cuff tear, which uh, there is a typical history, a click, and since then the patient is not able to lift the arm up. But if there is no history of trauma and there are some signs of radiation or some um, tingling, then a neurological uh, pathology should also be kept in mind. And if we think so, then we do a complete neurological examination. This leading, uh, with this uh, presenting complaints, it asks certain leading questions, find out how all these problems are affecting his life. Is work at work, home, work, sports, how is it affected? So understand how much problem the patient is having. Also, the past uh, treatment history, non-operative, operative, what he's already had, that will help us to plan further. Past medical history, uh, diabetes, uh, you know, hyperlaxity or any other medical problem, family history, especially ligamentum laxity and diabetes mellitus. Now with this in uh, place, we have already uh, stratified our causes of problem into, and hopefully we would have come down to four or five or probable causes of the problem of the patient. Now from here, we go to the examination of the shoulder. Now here we'll try to narrow down to one or two causes uh, which are the cause of the problem um, um, uh, of the patient. So exam, just like any other part, goes into look, feel, move, and special test. Same, uh, 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 this thing is used. So we start with uh, look, which is also called inspection, and that starts as soon as the patient walks into the clinic. How is he holding his upper limb? How is he load, holding his body? So that gives us some idea. Obviously, good history, and then a proper exposure for shoulder is required. The proper shoulder for uh, shoulder examination, the exposure is from umbilicus above, the body of the patient should be bare so that we can see both sides of the shoulder, front and the back and the neck. And uh, for the obviously for the female patient, we need a lady chaperone who would do the needful cover for us to be able to do the shoulder exam. Then if this male patient, just observe him, how does he remove his shirt? Also gives you clue about pathology that we are dealing with. And then the inspection goes without saying from the front, side, back, and do not miss from the top. There is one or two things that you can pick up from the top which uh, can be of importance. So in inspection, what or the look, what we are trying to look at is the uh, level of the shoulder, any deformity. We look at the skin for any scar marks in the skin which will tell us what has happened in the past. Sinuses uh, obviously tell us infective pathology and wasting of muscle, and any other positive thing that we can see um, uh, has to be noted down and compared to the other side to understand what is normal for the patient. From the front, we can see the sternum, the clavicle, the AC joint, shoulder for deformity, sulcus, any other uh, uh, wasting of uh, muscles, deltoid, pectoral, bicep, scalene from the side. The same thing is again um, uh, inspected and we look at the deltoid, we look at the scapula from the profile, high riding scapula, winging of scapula can be seen uh, here also. And then we look at the pectoralis major in profile in the front and the neck for any other pathology of the neck uh, that can be seen better on the side view. Once looking for the back, we reconfirm the shoulder level, which we had thought once we had seen in the front, we reconfirm. We look at the scapula for any abnormality and wasting of infraspinatus is seen well from back along with the parascapular and paraspinal muscles. And from the top, you can see the supraspinatus mainly and any wasting of supraspinatus which is very often uh, there uh, can be well appreciated from the top. As we have seen, then we go down to feeling that is palpation, have a routine, could be any, anybody can uh, 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 formulate their own routine. This is just one example of a routine that we follow, start from the spine of the scapula. So we start walking from the spine of the scapula, walk on to the acromion, ACJ, clavicle, ending up at sternum. Any pathology found anywhere, tenderness, then we dwell more into it. Otherwise, we go a low level below at some acromial space. Any tenderness, anterior lateral in subacromial space would be protector cuff uh, related, which will give us an idea. Feeling the bony structures there, Lesser tuberosity, greater tuberosity uh, groove could give us an idea of uh, bicipital uh, tendinitis and the coracoid process is to be felt for any pathology. Then the muscular and soft tissue tenderness. Along with that, 
any other finding of, as I said earlier, also swelling, scar, sinus has to be examined exactly how we would do in any general surgery or any other uh, place. Not forget to look for sensory uh, examination of the badge area because very often some of the shoulder pathology are having association uh, and if it is missed, it may be, uh, you know, mental. so do do uh, your badge area, put your hand and compare on the other side. And if there is any problem of sensory and you've been thinking in the, um, from the history, then go ahead and do the uh, uh, dermatological, uh, the uh, neurological examination, derm dermatomes and myotomes to be all checked. Then look at the movement in all the planes, forward flexion, extension, internal and external rotation by the side of the arm by the side of the body, and arm at 90 degree flexion, internal, internal rotation will tell you about the capsular stiffness, GERD, and all those things can be picked up there. And then abduction, adduction. And both active and passive have to be taken because they give you a lot of information about the pathology. We've already talked if there is a pain and restriction of movement during abduction at 90 to 100 degrees, we are looking at impingement. And if the same thing is at 150 degrees, then 160 degrees when we're looking at AC joint. If the active movement is much less and passive is much more, then we are looking at possibly rotator cuff tear. So there we have, um, uh, when we have a tear in rotator cuff, patient is actively not able to abduct or forward flex as compared passively, he or she may have full range of movement. So that gives us an idea about if active and passive is equal, likelihood is uh, either if it is frozen shoulder or some other traumatic pathology. So this gives important information for, um, for us to go further. Then we come down to muscle power testing. Again, individual muscles have to be tested. There are two groups of muscle, the local uh, rotator cuff muscle and the global muscle. So in the rotator cuff, we look at supraspinate test, which is done uh, in this fashion, which is also called MP can test. Patient abducts uh, the arm with complete internal rotation in this plane of the scapula and the examiner tries to resist that, uh, uh, that movement. And if there is a pain, it signifies tendonitis. If there's a weakness, then it signifies loss of power. Then similarly in infraspinatus, ISP is done arm by the side and uh, um, external rotation is done with the flex elbow and resistance is placed by the uh, examiner. If there is pain, or weakness, that's what we're looking for. Similarly, for the teres minor, we uh, we abduct the arm 90 degrees, elbow flex 90, and then the patient puts the arm back, that is external rotation, resisted by the examiner, and if it causes pain or weakness, then uh, it is positive. That is the uh, three muscles, then the left is subscap. Now in subscap, we have uh, various many tests, this is for some reason gone on its own. This is the belly press test, but uh, uh, that you can do. But what we do recommend the first test to do is the Gerber's test, which is the test wherein the patient's arm is internally rotated with the hand in the lumbar area, as you see there. And then the patient tries to lift the arm off the back while the uh, examiner is trying to resist. Any pain or weakness is uh, what uh, one is looking for. We already saw the belly press test in the front. And there is another one, bear hugger. But you, uh, if you have only one test, Gerber test, you can do well, that's good. But this is the bear hugger test where you put the arm, um, the hand on the other shoulder and the examiner tries to bring that palm off from the shoulder with the elbow and uh, uh, the wrist straight and patient complaining pain or Lots of uh, uh, power is uh, what we are interested in. Then, uh, then we look at the other muscles. Tack major is when the patient actually presses into the iliac crest with both uh, the uh, wrist at, and hand on the iliac crest. You feel for the anterior fold of uh, um, axilla, showing the tact major uh, uh, muscle. Biceps can be tested by speed test or Jagerson. In speed test, you keep the elbow straight and the arm is forward flexed and the um, examiner resisting the arm movement and any pain or weakness is what we're looking at. The Jagerson test is done in this fashion. You flex the elbow to 90 degrees 
and the patient is trying to supinate while the uh, examiner is trying to resist. So any pain or weakness uh, is uh, showing a positive test. Biceps is forceful extension of the elbow uh, against resistance, uh, can, can test the triceps and an ab abduction of the arm against resistance gives the deltoid uh, uh, muscle. Then we look at some special test or impingement from the history and examination. If we are thinking about uh, um, uh, impingement, then we do certain specific tests. We have already done the painful arc. We have done the power of uh, muscles. Then we do certain specific tests, Hawkins test for impingement. Here, the patient uh, is standing in front of the, of the examiner. The patient's arm is forward flexed 90 degrees and the elbow flexed to 90. And then maintaining the arm at the same level, the examiner internally rotates, bringing the greater tuberosity under the acromion and rubbing the origin of the uh, rotator cuff. And if there is any swelling or pain, the patient will complain of uh, pain if there is any tendinitis. Similarly, the nearest test can be done herein the arm uh, is internally rotated and in the uh, forward direction it is lifted up all the way till about 170 180 degrees if there is pain at 90 degrees that is uh, uh, rotator cuff tendinitis and if it is 160 70 it is ac joint then we also repeat the same test supinating the arm and if the pain goes away at 90 degrees that shows that it is a mild tendinitis of rotator cuff but AC joint pain will still persist even if you keep the palm supinate. So that gives us the information about uh, rotator cuff. Then in instability, we need to find out what kind of instability it is and also confirm. As I said, 90% time you will come across anterior instability. So we should be able to examine it quite nicely. So the apprehension test could be done in a standing position or lying down. So in standing position, this is how it is done. The examiner stands behind the patient. The patient's arm is abducted 90 degree plus and the elbow is flexed uh, 90 degrees. And then an external rotation force is given. And if the patient winces or uh, resists your movement, that shows that there is a forward push of the head of the humerus into the Vancard lesion, which patient tries to resist as positive test. Sometimes patient is having a lot of pain and apprehension sometimes leads to actual dislocation in the clinic. And if we want to avoid, then we can do a test which can give the same information, giving less pain to the patient, that is Job's relocation test. This is done with the patient lying on the bed. As you see here, the patient is lying on the bed, shoulder is at the edge of the table. And what we do again, the same thing. We abduct the shoulder to 90 degree plus, and then elbow 90 degree flexion. And then external rotation is done. And there's a hand in front of the humerus, which is holding the humerus in. For a second, we lift the hand up and the, the, the humerus moves forward. Patient has an apprehension, as you saw, and then you put the hand back to re-stabilize the shoulder so that the patient doesn't have a complete dislocation or serious pain, but you have got your information from that that there is an unstable shoulder and anterior instability is there. If you have instability, then you also need to look at humerus translation. This generally we do under GA, which gives a better information, but even in an active uh, a patient you can do. So you hold and stabilize the scapula and then with the other hand hold and stabilize the humerus and then move the humerus forward and backward relative to, uh, to scapula and see how much it moves. If it moves more than two quadrant then it is uh, lax and if it's more than three quadrant then it is almost unstable. So that gives us the humeral glide or humeral translation information. Then for posterior dislocation we uh, we uh, Test the patient uh, sitting or standing as we've seen in both the forearm. The arm is forward flex and adducted and an axial force is applied on the humerus stabilizing the back and this puts the stresses on the posterior capsule and labrum and if there is pain then uh, obviously it confirms the posterior labral pathology. And for the inferior uh, labral pathology we do the Fegan's test. Here as you can see the patient's arm is put on the uh, examiner's shoulder, elbow straight, and at that stage, uh, you put the downward force in the mid-arm region like this, and if there is any pathology here, uh, inferiorly, the patient would complain of pain, and uh, uh, the information is received. 
Then if the multi-direction, you would see a sulcus sign, you will be able to insinuate your finger under the acromion easily, and you pull the humeral, humerus of the arm down, and you can see those two dimples, as you see, this is a typical sulcus sign, uh, sign of multi-direction instability. If you're faced with a situation, or in case of any instability, it's, uh, it is always a victim that you look for hyperlaxity uh, by doing a beaten score. Then if you have a rotator cuff pathology, then you do the uh, test for rotator cuff muscles and you will get the, uh, get the idea uh, about the power. But sometimes if it is there, this is what is called the drop arm test. The patient tries to lift the arm up and they use a trick as she was able to do. And when you ask them to bring it down, they will again do a trick and then use the other arm support. So this is a typical drop arm test positive for a patient with rotator cuff tear. Uh, then for AC joint, again, you do cross adduction test where the arm is uh, forward flex and adducted and an axial force is applied. And as you adduct more and more elbow, a pain on the shoulder top is uh, signifying ACJ involvement. Last slide to come, don't forget the scapula. Look from the back for scapula rhythm. So ask the patient to forward flex the arm from the zero degrees and in abduction also, and look for the movement of the scapula. There may be an abnormal movement or there may be a winging of scapula. So this gives you an idea that something is happening at the back and uh, that can be factored in when we are trying to understand uh, what is going on and trying to come down to the pathology which is cause of the problem of the patient. So with this, we come down to the end of history and examination, which we have tried to cover all, which is basic. There are many tests described, but the commonest test and commonest thing that you should know and should at least have information uh, we have tried to convey. I wish all the very best to all. Thank you, the patient here. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Pratik. Your, uh, Dr. Pratik, can you hear me? Yes, I can, thank you. Your, this lecture has created a lot of uh, questions from the audience. Gee. So, uh, I will combine two questions. Here. One of the uh, postgraduate wants to ask you that what are the bony landmarks? Can you explain that uh, how to palpate them? And they especially want to know about the greater uh, tuberosity and the lesser tuberosity. Okay. How do you palpate the bony landmark? Can you just repeat that? Yeah, so bony landmark, as I said, you have to have a, a routine how to uh, uh, to go uh, about. So we started from the spine of the scapula. So we start right at the medial border of the uh, scapula with the spine. We go over the spine and we reach the posterior angle and then we come anteriorly onto the acromion and then to the AC joint and then the clavicle. Then we come back to the AC joint and at the anterior tip of the acromion, you slide your hand down and uh, there you would find your greater tuberosity. And if you feel and go slightly medially, you will feel a groove and then you will feel another tuberosity there, that is the lesser tuberosity. Now in a lean and a good patient, you are able to very well feel it. I'm trying to feel mine here and I'm able to feel it very clearly. But yes, in ladies and very muscular people, sometimes it can be difficult. So Doctor, your... uh, excuse me, can I? Yes, yes, Shusha. Yes. Uh, Dr. Patik, it, it might be easier if you stop sharing screen so that we can see you what you are doing. Yeah, I should stop sharing. Should I completely stop sharing? Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. I still see your, uh, yeah. So maybe then we can okay. see you. Uh, yeah. 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 So uh, as, as I was saying, we, we, we walk over the uh, back of the uh, spine of the scapula, coming to the angle and then coming anteriorly. Now this is the AC joint here that I'm feeling and this is the tip of the acromion and just slide your finger down and here generally you, you will feel a bony structure which is the greater tuberosity. And then if you go a little more medially, uh, you would see, you would feel the lesser tuberosity as Shashank is showing there, this, this spot is the lesser tuberosity. And in between there, you will feel a small valley uh, you can feel here. If you just move from, as I'm moving my finger from medial to lateral, there is this. And sometimes even you can feel the tendon slipping under in a lean and thin patient. But obviously, yes, in a, uh, in a lady or in an obese patient or in a very muscular patient, it can be uh, slightly difficult. But if you feel tenderness in that area, 
it gives you an idea we might be dealing with bicep uh, pathology and then we will go and do the speed test the yagerson test to see the uh, biceps uh, um, uh, and examine the biceps further yes Dr. shashank you saying something so uh, just a uh, just a, uh, another indicator about the biceps usually the biceps pain is going all the way around the upper arm it's not usually here so that it gives an idea that the pain is in the biceps uh, yeah. usually they said yeah and when you are mark when you are doing it it's always good to make a mark with your pen on the spine of the scapula then it will be easier for you to examine in the beginning sure as i said if you have primarily pain in the front of the shoulder going down to the belly and towards the uh, elbow then you think about biceps pain so uh, that is uh, that you get free information from your history also Dr. yes, Manish? yes. Uh, how do you palpate for shoulder joint line shoulder joint line now uh, this is something which is very uh, difficult to palpate shoulder joint line but you can be roughly in that area again what you do is you look at the uh, uh, the uh, as i said once you are going the uh, greater tuberosity to the lesser tuberosity if you go little more medial anteriorly just lateral to the coracoid this is the area where roughly anterior joint line is similarly for the uh, for like for all of us when we are doing injections to the joint we follow the rule we feel for the spine of the scapula we go about one and a half finger that is one and a half to two centimeter medial and about one to two centimeter lower and this is the area where steerly when you insinuate and this is all generally in even in the most muscular people you will feel a little depression there there's little um, uh, fossa there and when you push in there this is where you would uh, find your joint line and uh, how do you basically elicit the anterior and posterior joint line tenderness when you explain about the joint line is yes. the same place where you elicit the tenderness yes you would have to press the same uh, place uh, for joint line tenderness though i don't know how uh, relevant uh, it is in our examination because we have got tests which can give us but yes if you were to look at joint line tenderness these are the two points where i would press and uh, palpate to generate uh, pain or tenderness dr pratik what are the measurements that are that have to be taken during shoulder examination yeah so measurements um, uh, are uh, basically want to look at the height of the uh, of the uh, uh, arm so what you do is you look at the tip of the acromion and you take at the lateral epicondyle of the elbow from top to the bottom and uh, by a scale you can measure and you do it from the other side you try to measure the two you get an idea whether there is any uh, limb length discrepancy in the humeral side of the um, uh, of the shoulder dr pratik what are the clinical oh. points to consider for the deltoid contracture <clears throat> clinical points to think of uh, deltoid contracture now uh, there would be a history of uh, deltoid um, uh, when there is a deltoid contracture there has been history of trauma injection following which the patient has a uh, uh, problem uh, in this area there is pain the difficulty in abducting uh, the shoulder the, the power would be low and also you would see that the glenohumeral movement uh, may be restricted so all these things will give you an idea about uh, deltoid contracture and also you would see the scapula uh, uh, moving uh, in that particular direction dr pratik what is the ruler test in neglected dislocation the ruler test is you put the uh, ruler from the tip of the acromion and uh, to the lateral epicondyle if you are able to put that ruler that means the humeral head is not in position because normally the humeral head is there you are not able to put a scale which is touch the uh, the acromion and the lateral epicondyle because the humeral head pushes the shoulder the uh, ruler away if you are able to put a ruler from the tip to the lateral epicondyle that means the humeral head is not in its position okay dr pratik if the patient has thoracic outlet syndrome how do you differentiate it from the other shoulder pathologies the thoracic outlet syndrome there is a special test separate test you do when you abduct the arm all the way up and then you ask the patient to move the uh, the head or the uh, chin towards that side and if that causes the pain then uh, it could uh, denote uh, thoracic outlet syndrome also you feel for the power of the uh, the sorry the pulse the radial pulse in the arm by the side 
and then gradually you take it up and then you feel for the pulse at the abduction if there is a reduction in the volume of uh, the, uh, the pulse that also gives you an idea that uh, the patient may be having thoracic outlet syndrome. Okay, Dr. Vineet, you have any questions for Dr. Pratik? Or Dr. Any Manish, of the can I? May I? Yes, 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 sure, sure. yes, yes just a minute. Okay, uh, Vineet, you want to speak first? Please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Pratik, thanks for the nice presentation. I think most of the things were clear. A uh, few of my PGs, they were requesting uh, there is uh, what is the difference between the anatomical uh, move, anatomical uh, movement on the anatomical axis and the true axis on the shoulder joint. And secondly, if the examiner asks about the movements, now which should be told first? Like if it's a movement around the anatomical axis or a movement around the uh, true axis. Anatomical axis. See, uh, when we when the examiner is asking, we generally uh, talk in the in the form of uh, forward flexion uh, and then the extension. Then you formulate uh, the pathology. Also, will guide whatever is present. So. What we do is we ask for a forward flexion and then see how far the patient is able to do then the extension, then the rotations, the external or internal rotation by the side, which is at the long axis of the humerus that we are looking at, and then at 90 degree abduction again. So that gives the idea about the capsular contracture and then the abduction and the internal rotation and adduction both ways. Okay, Dr. Shashank, you can ask your question yes. and you also be ready with your presentation. I'm ready. Okay. So a uh, couple of things. Um, I didn't want to interrupt Pratik uh, regarding the questions. One is joint line tenderness. Somebody asked, I, I know why PGs are asking it. Usually examiners are fond of asking how to uh, find out the joint line tenderness. How Usually in shoulder, I don't know any condition where you actually need to. In ankle, in knees, joint line tenderness is very important. But I think Pratik already pointed out that joint line tenderness in shoulder is not very significant. So uh, when you are asked this question in the exam, especially for PGs, you, they would want an answer. So you tell them that, yes, we can palpate the joint more easily from the posterior aspect. You can do it, but it is difficult to do. And that's all the examiners want to ask. They want to know that you know something about it. But clinically speaking, it is not very relevant in most of the shoulder conditions. There might be some exceptions, but most of the times I have never looked for a joint line. I think Pratik would agree with me on that. Yes, Sashank. That's why I said that if yeah. they ask and you have to answer, then that is the yeah. point. You take exactly. this, uh, uh, the yeah. angle yeah. of the acromion, of the, yeah. of the spine, of the scapula, move oh. 1.5 centimeter to 2 centimeter medial and inferior. And if you put your finger there, so roughly that is the area. And so yeah. 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 you yeah. tell the examiner, I don't think so anybody would have uh, you know, uh, yeah. second anything. thing is about the abduction contracture. Somebody asked, uh, deltoid contracture, yes. a deltoid contracture. Uh, uh, besides the history and everything, which Pratik already mentioned, injections, either a brachial plyo palsy, old uh, deltoid problem. Uh, there is one thing, and uh, we saw this patient at the I think we presented it in the ODOT meeting uh, last time. These patients have so the deltoid is contracted. <laughs> So, but they want to bring the arm to the resting position. The moment they rest it because of the scapulothoracic movement, the scapula at the back becomes prominent. So rather than making, looking for deltoid, look at the scapula because they, they want to get the arm close to their body because that's the resting position. You cannot walk like this because of the abduction contracture. So they, they bring it down and the moment they bring it down, the scapula at the back becomes very prominent. So that is a sign that abduction contracture is there. And then you cannot adduct it, obviously. When there's a flexion deformity, you cannot extend. So when there's abduction deformity, you cannot adduct. So that is another thing. Dr. Shashag, yes. sorry, 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 I interrupted. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. No, no, you, you were telling something, Dr. Shashag. Yeah. You are telling. So, uh, uh, so that is that's about the deltoid contracture and the third thing about thoracic outlet syndrome. Again, from the exam point of view, so examiners love to needle you, and they will ask you, okay, why this is not thoracic outlet syndrome? Doctor Pratik already mentioned hyperabduction test, but trust me, this is a very rare diagnosis. So all the examiners are wanting you to say is. Sir, yes, I checked for a hyperabduction to look for radial pulse, but it is a very rare 
occurrence. It is not very common. I would not think of thoracic outlet syndrome in this patient. There are some cases. There is a cervical rape. It is very difficult to diagnose. But don't fall in the trap when the examiner asks you, okay, why it is not a thoracic outlet syndrome. I think that's it. Those are three things I needed to clarify. Okay, okay. Thank and you. Dr. Shashag, please be ready with your uh, presentation. Please, please, please share your screen. Yes, Dr. Dr. Sharad, Sharad is saying something. I yes. to make, uh, to oh, make sir. what Dr. Vineet was saying about the movement at the shoulder. What probably he wants to bring out is that the scapula is not uh, is at an angle from the body uh, plane, uh, about 18 to 20 degrees. So the patient, uh, the, the examiner asks for movements. So whether to tell the movements in the plane of scapula or in the plane of the body. Yeah, but, actually this was this was the thing which I really wanted to know because okay. PGs were slightly confused about that. Yeah, so uh, the, the movement uh, are in actually the plane of the body that we describe. But the tests that we do, like supraspinators we do, it is in the plane of the scapula. So like we do the Niels test, we do the empty can test. They're all in the <clears throat> scapular plane, which is 20 to 30 degrees uh, to, the, uh, to the body. Dr. Pratik, Dr. Pratik uh, how do you stabilize scapula while checking for the moment? Sure. So as I showed in one of the pictures, let's suppose we are on the right side of the shoulder of the patient. So with your left hand, your all the four fingers uh, will be on the top of the scapula. So just above the spine of the scapula. So they will be holding the scapula from the top. And your thumb will be on the lateral edge of the scapula. So you grab hold of the shoulder, uh, the scapula with your four fingers on the top of the spine and the thumb at the uh, media, the lateral edge of the scapula. And that's how the scapula is now in your uh, left hand. And then with your, when the patient does the movement or you do passively with your right hand holding the arm, then you can uh, uh, stabilize the scapula. Okay. Can I uh, request Dr. Shashank Mishra to uh, present his uh, okay. radiology PPT? Okay. okay. Uh, so we are going to talk about the shoulder radiology. Uh, thank you, Manish and Ravi. Um, this is going to be a very, very basic talk and the, the smarter once among you, I mean, talk, I'm talking to the PGs, might know a few things. I might be emphasizing a little bit too much on some rather basic things, which I think you should know. And many of us even miss after 10 or 15 years of practice. So this is what, uh, uh, how we'll start with the x-rays. I will touch a little bit about CT scan, ultrasound, and then we'll go about on the MRI. Uh, Manish, feel free to tell me when you want me to stop. So that is the one thing I want you to first start. Absolute zero tolerance for incorrect view. You see, uh, when you see, take an AP or a lateral view or an elbow, wrist or a knee or an ankle, it is rather easy to take. But shoulder and the hip joint are the two joints which are not in the exactly transverse plane of the body. So to take a good AP or a lateral view of a pelvic, I mean the hip joint, or the shoulder joint is rather difficult. Most, most of the times we end up getting a bad views. So please, first of all, develop the zero tolerance attitude for getting a good AP and a lateral view of the shoulder. And we'll talk about it in, in a little bit detail in the next few slides. If by any chance, in, suppose you're practicing tomorrow, you have a small clinic, you can't get good x-rays, whatever the reason is, or in the institution, it is not possible. Get additional tests, either a CT scan or a MRI, depending on whatever is the requirement, but must get at least two correct views. And if you can't get some additional test done. The only exception being a shoulder dislocation. It may not be possible, the patient is in pain and you may not be able to get all the proper tests. All you need to find out is where there's an associated fracture with the dislocation. So just take whatever good AP and lateral view you can. And as long as you have ruled out any GT fracture, any surgical neck fracture, go ahead and reduce it and then do whatever you want later on. But except for this, I would suggest that please develop an attitude of zero tolerance for incorrect views of the shoulder. And what is the correct and incorrect view? We are going, this is what we're talk, talking about. So we all know that every joint or every bone must be viewed from two directions. And that these two directions 
uh, should be perpendicular to each other. I think every PG knows, everybody, even a even MBBS guy is no guy knows about it that there should be two perpendicular views. Then what am I? Why am I talking about it? While AP view and lateral view is rather everybody knows that we need it. The problem is in the shoulder, it is very difficult to get. And most of the times, if you see, you, I, I, uh, I tell you tomorrow, tomorrow onwards, go to every shoulder patient you see, you have seen operated in your, in your OT or seen in your clinic and look whether they had a good AP and a lateral view. Most of the time, what happens is in a trauma patient, we move the arm either in a little bit this direction or a that direction, either internal rotation, external rotation, and that suffices for the two views. Usually it is the two rotations of the arm, that's it. So it's the AP and lateral view of the humerus. It is not the AP and lateral view of the shoulder. And what you need is an AP and lateral view of the shoulder. You don't need an AP and lateral view of the home humerus. You will need that when you are fixing a shaft fracture of the humerus. You don't need the AP and lateral view of the humerus here. So what exactly is the AP and lateral view? A good true AP view of the humerus is like this. You get a good space. The glenoid is well overlapped and what I mean it by overlapping is there are two surfaces as you would know the anterior and the posterior I'm going to talk about it there's a humeral head and there's a good joint space in between the coracoid is right there in the superior one third of the joint this is the coracoid and the acromion right on the top so this is a good true AP view and I'm going to talk about it why I'm calling it a true AP view we never talk about a true AP view of the knee we never talk about a true AP view of the ankle or the elbow but why are we talking about a true AP view of the shoulder uh, in a little while and you can you must have one lateral view most of the institutions can do a good axillary view or a y lateral view so i was fortunate enough to work in an institution in gangaram where dr bhasin had already done the difficult part he had already trained and like really had them to get a good bilateral view. So by the time I came, everybody knew how a good bilateral view is done. In most of the institutions, bilateral view is not properly done. So you need to know how to get a good bilateral view. And I'm going to tell you why it is important. Of course, axillary view, most of us get it. And most of the cold cases, we get a reasonably good axillary lateral view in most of the patients. So this is how a true AP view is done. And this is how it is different. In a true AP view, the, the person is not standing flat against the wall. The shoulder is against the cassette hair, but the person is tilted about 45 degrees. So it's, it's like this to give the orientation. There's a gap between the opposite side and the cassette. So by, while doing this, you get an exact true AP profile of the glenohumeral joint. You can even do it in the lying down position if the patient cannot stand, like in this position. Basically, you need a true AP view. In a regular AP view, it's actually an AP view of the chest. It is not the AP view of the glenohumeral joint. So point number one after today's class, PG class is differentiate between a true AP view and a regular AP view and learn how to get it done. Go to your radiology department, get it done yourself. So this is how a true AP view looks like. The anterior glenoid and the posterior glenoid look different. They are, they are separate and you know that this is not a good view. This is a good view. The anterior glenoid line and the posterior glenoid lines are perfectly overlapping. So you see good joint space there. And this is a true AP view. And this is exactly what I talked about. A lateral view, I think most of you would know. Actually, lateral view, you see a coracoid in the front. You see the acromion spine at the back, the glenoid, the humeral head. Uh, in most of the cold cases, it is rather easy to do it. Uh, and uh, we usually get it done in most of our institutions, not a problem. It helps you in seeing the anterior or posterior dislocation. This is the anterior dislocation. The humeral head has gone anteriorly. And this is a posterior dislocation where the head has gone posteriorly. And how do I know it? Because the, this is the coracoid, the lighthouse of the shoulder joint. It tells me that the, this is the anterior and this is the posterior. So I, it tells me whether this is the anterior dislocation 
or a posterior dislocation. Similarly, if there is a GT fracture, you will see uh, you will see the GT going at the back or the LT going here. So you you will know. But what happens, and this is how you do it. I think it it is not very difficult to do. You, I think most of you would know it. The only problem is, in some of the acute trauma patients, it is difficult to get an abduction. You need about forty to fifty degrees of abduction in the proximal humerus fractures where the patient is very painful, in frozen shoulder where it is very painful. It sometimes it is not easy to have the patient abduct to such such a degree of abduction. And the other thing is the camera needs to go way down. In most of the teaching institutions, the cap, you have got good machines and you may be able to do it. But tomorrow when you go and have your own x-ray in your own clinic, most of the time the camera cannot go down all the way to the le level of the table to get a good axillary view. Hence, you must know how to do a bilateral view. A bilateral view is so called because the scapula in this forms a Y. There's a glenoid in the center, there is a coracoid in the front, there's the spine of the scapula at the back, and all this makes a Y. And then the humeral head overlaps in exactly. So when it is dislocated anteriorly, that means towards the coracoid, you will see the head somewhere here. If it is dislocated posteriorly, you will see the head somewhere here. Yes, it cannot show you the GT fractures very easily because as you see, the GT is usually overlapped here. You cannot make out unless it is broadly significantly displaced superiorly, then you can see it here. But generally speaking, it gives you a good idea uh, to have a lateral view of the shoulder. And the, the good thing is you don't need any abduction. Though it is a little difficult to do and so this is how a posterior disorder. So if you if you don't know what you're looking at, this joint looks reduced. But actually, in this AP view, that in this view, the, the humeral head has gone back. And that can be seen on the Y view. You see the glenoid here, and the humeral head has gone posteriorly. This is some usually missed. So if you have a good Y lateral view, you will not miss it. So I've already talked about how a good Y lateral view looks like. The scapula, the body makes uh, the body makes the big stem of the Y, and then there are the two stems of the Y, the, the spinous process and the coracoid, and the humeral head right in the center. You, all, you also can see the AC joint, but I think that will be going in too much of detail. Let's not let's miss that. Now, coming to your exams, especially for exams. Some of the examiners really like to ask about the special view. Okay, what is a striker notch view? Okay, what is a moolah view? What is a uh, 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 Bernaggio view? They were really important in those days when we didn't have when we didn't have CT scan or MRIs. Most of the times, the striker notch view or the uh, west endpoint view or the Bernaggio view are rather difficult to do because we don't them too often. We don't get so many patients of doing it. So they are difficult to reproduce too. So uh, it, it is important for you to know a couple of views like a Bernaggio view for instability, a Moolah view or a Y view or a, a there, is, there are so many, there are about 30 different views. But if you can answer the, your examiner, yes, sir, I know the striker notch view is done for hip sac lesion. But in our institution, we rely more on CT scan to de detect the glenoid or the humeral bone loss. In most of the cases, the examiners will let you go, but they just want to needle you. So you should, you should know a little bit about it. So in my practice, and um, um, I think I can talk on behalf of a few of the people here that CT scan is usually indicated in almost all displaced proximal humerus fractures. There are some old time examiners which might be offended by that. Oh yeah, you want, you're gonna get CT scan in everybody. But I, in, in clinical practice, in, such, in all displaced proximal humerus fractures, it is better to get CT scan done because simply because I don't want to miss any fragment. Many a times, even in in a big institution, if you're working there, it is difficult to get good AP lateral views and you don't want to subject the patient to go and go back again and get so many views. 
So CT scan gets up, give much more information, and I think it is worth it. I would definitely get a CT scan done in a scapular fractures. As you know, scapula is a three-dimensional bone. It's not a longitudinal bone. The glenoid, the body, the coracoid, they're all over the place. You cannot see all of them in an AP or a lateral view. So for scapular fractures, I would always get a CT scan done. In shoulder replacements, yes, but uh, I think Raman is gonna talk about it in detail. In dislocations, yes, I get a CT scan rather than MRI. And whenever I'm not happy with two or three good x-rays, I'm not sure that there are not there are good AP and lateral views in my practice. I, I always try to get a CT scan just to make sure that I'm not missing on anything. So uh, if, when you are dealing with proximally humerus fractures, and I think these are the most common shoulder cases you see in your hospital, in your uh, setting right now, uh, make sure that you are getting two perpendicular views of the shoulder, not humerus. And if you are treating a, conservative, a fracture conservatively, make sure that you always get serial x-rays. Even in innocent two-part fractures, a fracture which may look good today may, may displace tomorrow. So please get serial x-rays. Ultrasound. Uh, this is something most of the, I get most of the questions after my shoulder imaging uh, lecture in most of the conferences. It is good. Ultrasound is rather reliable when it is done by a good person. I don't get it done because I don't know how to see ultrasound images. I don't, I don't think most of us can read ultrasound images. In only last 10 years, I have learned to read MRI images. To read ultrasound images is well nigh difficult. Uh, so unless you have a good ultrasonologist who you can rely on, who will pick up everything, and more, mainly in rotator cuff tear and biceps lesions, ultrasound is a good modality. If you have a good ultrasonologist, go ahead, get it done. But otherwise, in all soft tissue areas where I am not sure about my diagnosis, I go for MRI. So talking about MRI, so a couple of questions, usual questions which I ask, I'm just trying to preempt them here. Uh, a good 1.5 Tesla is good enough, definitely not a 0.5 Tesla. In smaller cities of India, still we have a lot of MRIs, even in Delhi, we have a few MRIs which are 0.5 Tesla. I don't think they are good for a small joint like shoulder. They might be good for head or spine, but for shoulder, which is a rather small joint, in fact, even for a 1.5 Tesla, a local surface coil for the shoulder is more important. Let's not get into the nitty gritty, but just for you to know that minimum must get a MRI shoulder of a 1.5 Tesla, but if there's an option, get a three Tesla MRI. When you're reading the shoulder MRI, uh, always follow a fixed protocol. And what is that protocol? First of all, make a broad clinical diagnosis in your mind. And most of the shoulder problems can broadly be classified into these three problems. Either is the subacromial space problems like impingement, rotator cuff tears, partial, complete, small, medium, large. So first make sure in your mind, what are you dealing with? Are you dealing with the rotator cuff problems? Are you dealing with a different, a, a different type of instability? or something which doesn't fall into either of the two. And then there are biceps lesions. Uh, Dr. Pratik has already talked about uh, all those problems. So what I'm trying to tell you here is that before you start reading MRI, in your mind, you must have some broad diagnosis which, so that you can focus on that thing. If you don't have any clue what that patient has, it, will, it is very difficult to find a problem in the MRI, unless it is rather obvious, like a massive rotator cuff tear or a head dislocated, uh, chronic dislocation, you will have difficulty reading the MRI. Have some basic diagnosis in your mind. Goes without saying uh, that frozen shoulder, you don't need MRI to diagnose. There are some MRI findings in frozen shoulder, but trust me, a simple true AP and a bilateral or an axillary lateral view is good enough to diagnose the frozen shoulder. So I already talked about it, don't report, don't read the report. Uh, um, always follow a pattern, make a diagnosis in your mind, find out what are the coronal cuts, read the coronal cuts first, 
then go to the axial cuts and in the end go to the sagittal cuts and if you always follow a routine over the next 6 months to 1 year in your remaining pg time uh within a year or so you will be able to read it as good as you are reading your spine mri i think most of the pgs are very good in reading spine mris but not as much in shoulder so what exactly is a coronal cut coronal cut is exactly the same as a true ap view of the shoulder and i use this synonym just to remind me cap the coronal cut goes anterior to posterior so make a picture in your mind that you are looking at ap view of the shoulder and every cut the coronal cut will take subsequent slices of the shoulder from anterior to posterior about 20 or 30 slices i'm going to show you about 5 or 6 because of the paucity of time but if you just know that the coronal oblique cuts are basically the ap view of the shoulder that will help you get oriented very easily so just to get you started this is the glenoid this is the humeral head rather easy to understand this big belly, muscle belly here is the supraspinatus belly it's coming here and attaching right there at the gt here this is the superior labrum the inferior labrum these are the axillary vessels here usually most you don't see much problems here and then you see acromion or clavicle depending on which cut or which slice you are taking among the first few anterior cuts if you recall your shoulder anatomy you will see the coracoid so look for the coracoid and that will tell you that this is the anterior most cut now when you see the coracoid you can visualize in your mind that the humeral head should be somewhere here the glenoid is somewhere here and this is most probably the clavicle why it is clavicle we'll come to that later so this is uh, the the coracoid and then we'll go we'll go from there just under the coracoid is the subscap this is a subscap muscle coming from here and attaching to the lt this is the deltoid just to get you oriented as you go a little further posteriorly you will see less and less of this supraspinatus belly and more and more of the tendon you see this tendon here this black thing here is the tendon this thing is the muscle the dark black thing is the tendon attaching on the gt footprint this is the footprint from here to here it is about 1 cm beyond or lateral to the articular margin that the cartilage ends here and it attaches somewhere here on the gt so this is what you call the footprint the where the supraspinatus or the rotator cuff muscle attaches and as i said this is the clavicle you are going a back with every uh, subsequent cut so you are just beginning to see the acromio clavicular joint the acromion is just beginning to become visible and the clavicle is right here when we go, as we go further back um, somebody is yawning anyway <laughs> so as we go further back you see more and more of acromion you see the ac joint and you see so why do you, how do i how do you make out if you if i show you just this cut how do you make out whether this is acromion or clavicle this is something uh, many times my fellow get confused so clavicle is medial to the highest point of the head this is the highest point of the head clavicle is always medial to the highest point of the head whereas the acromion is either at the highest or lateral so if you if you if you feel your shoulder or if you look at the shoulder model acromion is the lateral most structure on the roof of the shoulder whereas clavicle is medial so this is the acromion and then of course there is a suprascapular notch we are not going to that this is almost the most posterior cut right at the back of the shoulders after this you will start seeing the posterior deltoid and this is the infraspinatus tendon you see the spine of the scapula this is the acromion continuing at the spine of the scapula this is the infraspinatus coming here and attaching so there is a bit of about half to 1 1 cm of infraspinatus which you can see in the coronal cut 
infraspinatal is not a horizontal muscle coming behind the humeral head it is a, a bit about 1 cm of it or half cm of it comes on top of the humeral head merges with the supraspinatus tendon and attaches on the greater tuberosity here so if you see white signal here you see that means it the, the tear is extending into the infraspinatus and i'm going back to there if you see a white signal here you that means it's a ten, the tear of the supraspinatus after that you go to the axial cuts and just to get you oriented try to remember an axillary lateral view the ax axial cuts of the mri are just like the axial cuts of the axillary view and they go superior to inferior so you start from the top of the shoulder skin clavicle ac ac joint acromion and then tendon of the supraspinatus and then the so on and so forth so this is what i was talking about this is the spine of the scapula this is the supraspinatus uh, this is all the deltoid all around anterior posterior and the middle and this is the supraspinatus belly and going into the attaching to the uh, to the greater tuberosity as you go a little further down uh, sorry as you go a little further down you start seeing the coracoid that again is the lighthouse of the shoulder it tells you that you are in this is this all this is the anterior part of the shoulder and by corollary all this is the posterior part why it is important is once you know what is the anterior and what is the posterior on the axial cuts you will be able to know where the bank cart lesion is you will be able to see the subscap is in the anterior the posterior cuff is at the back so it will get you oriented and help you know what structure is it this is the glenoid the coracoid and the humeral head as you go further down you start seeing the anterior labrum this is the glenoid the anterior labrum because there's a coracoid right there you start seeing the subscap you start seeing the infraspinatus infraspinatus coming here and attaching here this is the infraspinatus tendon this is the subscap tendon and as you start as you keep going further down you see the lower and lower part of the humor of the glenoid and the humeral head make sure to see where the coracoid is it is important in more than one way not only it tells you that it is this is the anterior and this is the posterior it also tells you at what level of glenoid you are vis-a-vis -vis supra inferior so coracoid you stop seeing coracoid roughly about 3 o'clock position once you stop seeing coracoid that means now you are in the area of the bank cart lesion so this is the glenoid this is the anterior labrum and this anterior labrum if there is a tearing here or a white signal here between the bone and the labrum that means there is a tear of the bank cart i will just go back just to tell you something at this level the lesion of the labrum is not important it can be present normally we call it sublabral recess foramen or whatever you may call it but as you go further down where when the coracoid is not visible anymore and the labrum is attached that means you rule out another way to see whether you are further or you are sufficient down is you can see the bicipital groove this is the this is the gt this is the lt i'm sorry and you see the biceps tend longer of the biceps in this so once you see a good biceps groove that means you are you are sufficiently down the glenoid and you can reasonably make a uh, diagnosis that is a bank cart lesion or not if if this is torn it is bank cart if this is torn it, it is called reverse bank cart and you sometimes you see these funny uh, bony islands in the shoulder don't worry about it you go further down you see uh, you see bicipital groove thinning out it's becoming more and more shallow and this is almost about 5 o'clock so you almost at the bottom end of the glenoid in this in this and in this case the labrum is securely attached to the glenoid what are sagittal cuts important for in most of the cases sagittal cuts are only important to see the chronicity or how old the rotator cuff tear is Uh, it tells you whether this rotator cuff tear is repairable or not but just to keep it simple for you this is the scapula 
And again, you need to know which is anterior and posterior. Is this the anterior, the coracoid, or this is the anterior? A very easy thing to remember is the scapula is antiverted. I think everybody knows that. So if the scapula is tilted this way, that means this is anterior and this is posterior. So anterior is which muscle? That is the subscap. Posterior is infraspinatus anteries, and on top is the supraspinatus. So this is the supraspinatus muscle belly. This is the infra and the teres muscle belly, and this is the subscapularis muscle belly. If these muscles are not occupying the entire space, they are shrunk. It is called the muscle atrophy, indicating a long-standing old chronic rotator cuff tear. I think that is uh, enough at this level for you to understand that, okay, sagittal cuts, I will see to see whether the super rotator cuff muscles are good belly or good strength or not. So uh, just to complete it, you, you can also see the AC joint, uh, but I, and you can see the rotator cuff hood over the head. This is the spine, this is the acromion, so there's the posterior cuff, supraspinatus, and the anterior cuff. If this cuff, you see all white hair, there, here you can see the tendon. If you see all white hair, that means there is a massive rotator cuff tear involving all these muscles. So to conclude, uh, uh, I think all of us, uh, you, me, whether you're a professor, you become a professor tomorrow, or a, you go into private practice, please make sure that you learn on how to do three shoulder x-rays yourself. Most of the radiographers would not know the difference between an AP and a true AP view. They would know an axillary lateral view, but why lateral view is something most of the people don't know. So please make sure that you know, know how to do them yourself. If you are not able to get good views in a fractured situation, please get a CT scan done. I'm not saying that CT scan should be done in every patient but learn to do the good shoulder exercise. But if you are not doing, before you make a final decision for a treatment of a patient, get a CT scan done. For a frozen shoulder, please don't prescribe unnecessary uh, investigations. They just are not required. Not only they are not required, they will throw you off the tangent. Most of the shoulders will have some partial cuff tear. They might have a slap lesion. And then you start thinking of something else. You get all confused. Oh, this is a slap tear. Now I need to do a surgery. For a frozen shoulder, only X-ray is enough. You don't need any other investigations. If you're dealing with a recurrent dislocation of the shoulder, go for a CT scan rather than MRI if the patient cannot afford a lot of tests. In rotator cuff tears, if you are taking them for surgery, please make sure that you look at sagittal sections to see whether the cuff is really repairable. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Shashank, for such a nice presentation. Uh, there are a uh, few questions for you. It will be a rapid fire session. Yes. Because we are, you know, uh, have less time. I request, meanwhile, Dr. Raman Khan to be ready with his presentation. Now, uh, Dr. Shashank, uh, what should be the position of forearm while taking the AP view? Okay, so uh, there, there are uh, there are many uh, uh, many different uh, uh, publications which say, but I would say for a good true AP view, keep it either in the neutral rotation, about five to ten degrees of external rotation. Okay, now it's a rather dangerous question in exam, but uh, audience wants to know if view is not correct, should we say that in exam that this is not a true AP view? Okay, so uh, so number one, I think for the PGs, never be cocky with the examiner. Don't try to show something that you know and you want to show off your knowledge. All you can say is, sir, though it is not a true AP view of the shoulder, it's a regular AP view, I think based on this X-ray, these are the findings. So basically what you're trying to do is you're telling him that I don't want, I can't, you don't, you can't find fault with me if I miss some info finding on this X-ray. And the moment you say that you are it is not a true AP view, the question will go towards the true AP view. And you know how to get a true AP view done. So the examiner will start talking about true AP view. So make sure that uh, you don't, you don't act cocky in front of the examiner. Okay. And uh, Dr. Shashank, how do you position the patient uh, for scapular wide view? 
Okay, um, uh, I wish I could show, I had a very good video and actually Dr. Basin had asked me to make a video for that uh, bilateral view. So um, if, 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 if you want, I can, if there's time I, at the end, I can show you the video. It's yes, about yes. a one minute video, how to do it. Yeah, I will give you time in, at yeah. the end. Yeah. And uh, I think uh, there is another question related to it that how do you say it is a correct scapular view, like a scapular Y view? I think that will take with the last only. Okay. 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 And uh, Dr. Raman Kant, you are ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Can you see okay. me? Yes, yeah, yeah, Dr. Just, Manish. Dr. Manish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dr. Vineet, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Shishan, very nice presentation. Yeah, things have become very quite clear to the PG. Uh, you have mentioned that for frozen shoulder, only the X rays are required. But you have not mentioned what are the what is the finding in the X-ray to diagnose oh, the frozen shoulder. Very good question. Thank you, Vinny. Uh, so, what are the findings? I think everybody should know this. What are the findings of frozen shoulder on X-ray? No findings. The frozen shoulder Y view or an axillary view or a true AP view should look like an exactly normal shoulder, like your or mine shoulder. If you see the definition of frozen shoulder, it is restriction of shoulder motion in all directions with no radiological findings. Okay. So it is a purely clinical diagnosis. You get x-ray done just to rule out other problems. You don't get x-ray done to diagnose shoulder, uh, frozen shoulder. You do x-ray in frozen shoulder to rule out any osteoarthritis, any dis any neglected dislocation or other things. Yeah, okay. thank you, Edmund. This now, is what I uh, wanted the, to carry the message to the children. Yeah, that is a very good question. Other, other, I'm glad otherwise, you Dr. Shashank, uh, yeah. there is thank a question you. related to it. How do you differentiate between uh, uh, tuberculosis uh, of shoulder and periarthritis radiological? Uh, okay. This is my, the okay. whole talk is on this. Okay, okay. Then we'll take. Okay, Raman Kanji, you you, you answer this question. And uh, 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 this, this, has, to... this question will be answered in the talk in the slide. Okay. So please go ahead with your talk. Okay, thank you, thank you, Manish. Thank you, Ravi. So thank this you. is how I perceive the shoulder. I know the guys you have gone through the history, clinical examination, and an excellent demonstration of x rays. But now you are in the clinic, the theoretical knowledge is over. So I will give you my perspective. How do I think of the problem of a clinical problem when the patient walks into my clinic? Now, I always consider shoulder to be a double story house. So I know for sure that ground floor has got only glenohumeral joint and some spaces outside the glenohumeral joint. So what can happen in a glenohumeral joint is a frozen shoulder, arthritis, dislocation, and labral injuries, these four problems. Whereas in the first floor, you have an AC joint problem, bursitis, rotator cuff tendons, tears, and calcific tendonitis. So origin of diagnosis, you have to have the history, anatomy, function, and physical science. Of all, history is the most important, and Dr. Prati Gupta has shown it clearly. So what are the problems, clinical problems? There are some treatable problems, some diagnosable but untreatable problems, and some undiagnosable problem. A very good point with Dr. Shashank said, if you cannot think of a diagnosis, a provisional diagnosis, you cannot be ordering an MRI. Before ordering an MRI, you have to have some direction in which you are thinking a probable pathology lies. So these are the treatable problems. Stability, problem of stability, problem of motion, problem of smoothness, and problem of strength. This is the problem which we are going to deal with. The talk is frozen shoulder, periarthritis, or caries shoulder, or tuberculosis of the shoulder. So this involves problems of motion, which is frozen shoulder, or basically a stiff shoulder. When we come to pro problem of smoothness, impingement, arthritis, arthritis come in problem of smoothness. So we are dealing with problem of motion or problem of smoothness here. So problem of smoothness, most common is impingement. But remember, if you find stiffness in your examination, there was a question which asked, was asked, how do we do the glenohumeral or scapulothoracic movement? So all movements done by the patient basically which are active, are a combination of glenohumeral and scapulothoracic movements. You don't divide them into anything. 
but all passive movements which we elicit from the patient by stabilizing the scapula are all passive movements and primarily measure the glenohumeral movement. So for to diagnose impingement, shoulder cannot be stiff. If shoulder is stiff in the terminal degrees of forward flexion, abduction, external rotation, internal rotation, you cannot diagnose impingement. That would be a false diagnosis. Glenohumeral impingement or subacromial impingement, you don't need to get into the detail because now the situation is a patient is having stiff shoulder. Shashank has shown the x-rays. So you order the relevant x-rays. This is an AP view, which is a cephaloid tilt because we want to see the subacromial space. This is a true AP view. We want to see the glenohumeral space. This is a supraspinous outlet view, which is the superior half of the scapular outlet view and the axillary view. As Shashank said, in frozen shoulder, active and passive both movements are restricted in all planes and they are equal. If passive movements are more and active are less, you are looking at rotator cuff tears. X-rays have to be normal, true AP and axillary. In this case, AP X-ray will not suffice. You have to have a true AP view because the only true differential of uh, frozen shoulder is arthritis. So what kind of arthritis? There are six types of arthritis in the shoulder, primary OA, secondary OA, rheumatoid arthritis, arthritis following ABN, capsulorathy arthritis, cuff tear arthropathy. And all can be diagnosed except for primary osteoarthritis and cuff tear arthropathy. They look the same on the X-ray, but all other else look different on the X-ray. There is one more condition that patient can walk in your OPD with sudden loss of all the movements and acutely painful and patient won't even allow you to touch himself. So this is acute calcific tendinitis. Um, in this, it is a painful and stiff shoulder, sudden onset, histories of last night, it strikes like gout. Patient will not allow any passive movements. X-ray may or may not be normal, and ultrasound is quick and diagnostic. So in stiff shoulder, we are talking of frozen shoulder now, and we are talking of primary frozen shoulder. It is absolutely different from a secondary frozen shoulder. Secondary frozen shoulder is something which is caused by some disease or surgery or trauma. Whereas primary frozen shoulder has got no history of injury and no history of surgery. These are the only four essential diagnostic criteria for frozen shoulder no history of injury, no history of surgery, global restriction of active and passive movements in all the planes, and normal true AP and axillary views. If you find these four criteria and you are able to check the rotator cuff strength a little bit in whatever position of abduction, you are almost sure that you are dealing with a frozen shoulder if the rotator cuff strength is reasonably okay and not painful. But if you find the strength testing of rotator cuff is painful or is weak, then you need to order an MRI because some frozen some rotator cuff tears do present with frozen shoulder as well. So I'm not going to go into the detail, but I would like to say one thing for sure. This is a DOA club and your postgraduates. Periarthritis term was introduced by Duplay in 1872 stopped being used in the Western world in 1934. And we are 2020. I think we should stop using the term periarthritis loosely. There's nothing like periarthritis. We still call it a frozen shoulder now, back from adhesive capsulitis, because periarthritis is abundant. And we talk of frozen shoulder, primary or secondary. As I said, the essential criteria I've already covered, but imagine, this is the most important thing, normal true AP and axillary views, which is going to distinguish it with the arthritis. I'm not going to go into the detail, but this is one thing which I do. I'm coming to the exam now. What I do in my OPD, passive external rotation with arm in A deduction is the first test I do. And I compare it on both the sides. I conduct it simultaneously on both the sides and I compare if I find that the external rotation with arm in A deduction is normal, equal, painless on both sides, I rule out frozen shoulder, I rule out arthritis, I rule out locked posterior dislocation. 
<clears throat> so as you see in this x-ray, the joint space is decreased, glenohumeral joint space is decreased. There is osteophyte on the humeral as well as the glenoid side. The acromiohumeral space is totally gone. There is this white line under the acromion. There are cysts in the greater tuberosity area. This is definitely not a frozen shoulder, although patient will present as painful stiff shoulder. So I'm skipping the pathology and everything, the theoretical part, because I've got only 10 minutes to do that. But this is the current thinking on frozen shoulder, cytokines and vascular endothelial proliferation. MMPs can have a role. Investigations, as Shashank said, X-rays, in doubtful cases, MRI. I would suggest MRI if you are in a little bit of doubt. Remember, I have seen two patients with chondrosarcoma presenting as frozen shoulder. The third case was carcinoma esophagus and secondaries in the frozen shoulder, presented as frozen shoulder. So tumors can present as frozen shoulder. So beware. If you've got doubt and if you've got good quality X-rays, you can rule out everything fine. But if you don't have X-rays, and you can't get the good quality x-ray, get an MRI scan. Freezing face, management of frozen shoulder is easy. Freezing face, only glenohumeral injection and stretches, frozen face stretches, thawing face, again stretches. So this is how the x-ray of a frozen shoulder looks like. A true AP view, absolutely normal proximal humerus, absolutely normal glenoid, absolutely normal acromion and AC joint arch. There's nothing wrong in the x-ray. Whereas this is a classical primary osteoarthritis. I see many patients of arthritis being labeled as tuberculosis, which is wrong. Tuberculosis may be common in, in India, <clears throat> but believe me, osteoarthritis is as common. So this is a classical arthritis. You see the sclerosis there. You don't see that in tuberculosis. Now, this is the most important part of the presentation today, of the lecture today. This is the most important slide. And you see a big osteophyte there. You don't find these osteophytes in tuberculosis. You find cysts there. You find joint space reduction. You don't find sclerosis. You find total uh, osteoporosis. You find erosions there. So there's a lot of difference between an X-ray of an arthritis and a tuberculous arthritis. But rheumatoid arthritis can actually fool you. And you need to be pretty sure that whether it is rheumatoid arthritis or tuberculosis arthritis, both will present with the same kind of radiological picture. Both can have a CBC deranged and ESR and CRP raised. So it is important that in such cases, you will have to go further in investigation to prove your diagnosis. So tuberculosis shoulder is <clears throat> only one to 3% of the extra pulmonary skeletal tuberculosis. And this is common form is caries sicca, which is a dry form. Rarely you find swelling, abscess, and sinus. Uncommon to present in stage of sinovirus. And rest of the things are as for any other osteoarticular tuberculosis. It is basically a disease of adults extremely rare in children. Clinical features, as explained, along with the general TB symptoms, constitutional symptoms, radiological chest x-ray, shoulder x-ray, CT, MRI, bone scan, MONTU test, and biopsy, arthroscopic or open biopsy is the mainstay. And I'll come to it, why do we need to achieve a biopsy and a tissue diagnosis before we subject the patient to such a diagnosis and ask him to take medicines for 12 to 18 months. Culture is possible and can be obtained even in two to three weeks and maybe in eight weeks. The best one is the eight weeks, but still we can take the biopsy, put the patient on to antitubercular treatment <clears throat> and send for these cultures as well. MRI is extremely sensitive in the early detection of osteomyelitis at very contrast enhanced MRIs. So if in doubt, get the MRI. Synovial fluid aspiration is insufficient to make a diagnosis. There are a lot of differential diagnoses. I have dealt with this. Septic arthritis, you will find swelling, increased temperature, warmth, 
frozen shoulder, you will not find anything clinically. Impingement, we have discussed. Osteoarthritis, we have discussed. Synovial osteochondromatosis, I will come to the couple of cases. PVNS, gout and hemophilic arthropathy, you will have something in the history. Anti-tubercular drugs, preferably after culture sensitivity and histopathology due to emergence of MDRN strains. 33% of patients are having a multi-drug resistance. So that is why you should obtain a tissue diagnosis. Arthrodesis probably may be a choice in, in a patient, but preferably avoid it. So this is a case of my patient who presented to me in synovitis stage with extensive synovitis, rice bodies, and relatively all the movements were preserved. So clinical radiological impression is not the diagnosis. MRI and imaging, no gospel truth. Adequate cultures are possible. Are we heading to pre-antibiotic era? We need to be sure before instituting the treatment. A patient with frozen shoulder and concomitant pulmonary tuberculosis may be misdiagnosed as K-Resica. This is one of my patients again, 34 years old. And he presented to me four years after onset of symptoms. That was the condition. That was his axillary view. You can see all the bone is eroded. There's cavity formed. Joint space is reduced. Big cysts, even in the axillary view, even on the glenoid side. Scapular lateral view, which showed me that it is primarily glenohumeral. The subacromial space seemed to be okay. That was his MRI, the axial cut. <clears throat> his glenoid and head of the humerus both were destroyed. That was the glenoid. Uh, so that is the end of my presentation. But I can, uh, I did this uh, uh, arthroscopic debridement and biopsy in this patient, and he achieved at the moment he has a full range of movement after immediate rehab. But I did send him to the tuberculosis expert so that I don't manage his uh, anti-tubercular treatment. Take the help of your medical colleagues. But of course, you should know the uh, the latest regime of tuberculosis. I'm sorry, I don't know the latest regime of tuberculosis. But I treated him with the old regime of four drugs for two months and then two drugs for further 12 months. Any questions? Yes, Dr. Raman Khan. Yeah. Uh, there's a question for you that uh, what are the clinical points except uh, history you inquire in Kerry Sikha? The constitutional symptoms, history of cough, pulmonary tuberculosis, extra pulmonary tuberculosis, if I'm suspecting a, a carry sicka. Okay. Yeah. Lymph nodes in clinical exam, you will check for the lymph nodes. Okay. Supraclavicular, axillary lymph nodes. Okay. So, any other question for uh, Dr. Raman Kaab from the panel? Uh, I have one question. Uh, can I? Yes, can I run sir, this sure, video? Sure. Yeah, you can run this video. You can run this oh, video. Tell me which shoulder. This is the same gentleman I showed you the X-rays. He's got full range of movement now. But that was aggressive debridement at presentation, putting him onto the ATT and completing the course and extensive rehab. Yeah, what's the question? So, Raman, uh, one thing which has always confused me is uh, while making a diagnosis for a frozen shoulder is a patient with diabetes mellitus uh, or a uncontrolled thyroid or uncontrolled diabetes, would you call that a primary frozen shoulder or a secondary frozen shoulder? No, that will be a primary frozen shoulder. It will not be a secondary. Diabetes, thyroid and all the associations are associations. They will still remain, it will still remain a primary. The secondary frozen shoulder will only be if it is produced by injury or surgery or some disease. Okay. Okay, uh, one, uh, one, uh, two, uh, two remarks for the PGs. Uh, uh, I think uh, Raman made this point very clear and I just want to re-emphasize it that passive ER for, really, for diagnosing frozen shoulder. I think Dr. Maishwari calls it uh, the no external rotation test. You can, you can call it whatever you want, but it cannot be overemphasized that 
if a patient has a passive external rotation if you can rotate the patient externally on your own then it is not a frozen shoulder please don't diagnose the frozen shoulder we all of us get so many so many uh, uh, patients sent to us by diagnose by being labeled a frozen shoulder that it is unbelievable and the one last thing is before we go to the next presentation is stiff shoulder is not equal to frozen shoulder stiff shoulder is a finding for various reasons for osteoarthritis because of rotator cuff tear because of any other uh, 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 immobilized shoulder you can have a stiff stiff shoulder but a frozen shoulder is a diagnosis it has to be there in absence of any injury and any radiological finding i think that is something you need to remember for your clinics and your exams over to europe can okay. i start with the next talk yes yes dr maheshwari please Uh, no, uh, uh, Raman Khan. I think uh, you are doing the rotator cuff. You can do finish it off now. Because yeah. We have to, okay, finish it off. Finish it off. So, this is how the <clears throat> your rotator cuff is. So we've removed the acromion. That's the clavicle, and that's the lateral part of the acromion. But you see the coracoacromial ligament going to the coracoid, and you are looking at the shoulder right as like you will look at the shoulder in a lateral view. You will see the subscapularis. You will see the coracohumeral ligament. you will see the supra spinatus but can you identify anything between supra and infra this is actually infra spinatus supra spinatus is only less than a centimeter 8 mm insertion and this is the infra spinatus right and that's the subscapularis this ligament is the cause of frozen shoulder the most common cause is you are driving alone you are carrying a briefcase you put your briefcase on the back seat on the passenger side and you are trying to lift the back seat the coracohumeral ligament gets stretched this is the although i said no history of injury but this is the ligament responsible for frozen shoulder but five there are two three joints acromioclavicular sternoclavicular and glenohumeral and two articulations subacromial and scapulothoracic are articulations we must understand this slide <clears throat> so rotator cuff is actually a misnomer it is a compressor cuff it compresses the ball of the humerus which is two and a half times bigger than the glenoid it creates a horizontal force couple from subscapularis which gives 60% power to the joint to infraspinatus and supraspinatus and teres minor which only give 40% power external rotators are still 40% internal rotators subscap is 60% but they balance out they hug the ball of the humerus like this and compress it into the glenoid and they also produce some rotations but their primary work is to maintain the stability of the shoulder joint why do we need to know about the rotator cuff is the most common shoulder problem of all the problems of the shoulder rotator cuff pathology is the most common <clears throat> its prevalence at 50 years of age 10 to 11% of normal population is having frozen shoulder at 80 years of age 36% asymptomatic tears are twice as common so you can think that in faculty at least one or two people will be having it at least me i might be having it because i'm 50 plus why do we need to know about them untreated tears progress in size become chronic and retracted and become irreparable symptoms worsen and function deteriorates fatty degeneration destroys the muscle valleys risk of developing rotator cuff tear arthritis that's the importance of rotator cuff history i am not going to bore you with this history let's go back to this history history of trauma may or may not be present traumatic cuff injury can happen to any age right from 20s to 80s non traumatic cuff tear is commonly present in the fifth decade onwards symptoms pain is the most common symptom night pain is usually present weakness may be present alone along with pain and difficulty in adx so this is my protocol of examining a rotator cuff suspected pathology first of all we need to examine the c spine we need to carry out the neurological examination of the extremity to rule out brachial plexus pathy if we don't do it in this order we are likely to miss rule out stiffness as i said impingement cannot be diagnosed with stiffness and if rotator cuff 
their presence with stiffness, that will be a challenge to diagnose clinically. <clears throat> Look for the signs of bicep disease. I only rely on speech test, but you must know the ergasan as well. I don't rely much on the bicep tenderness. For me, tenderness in any pathology of the shoulder, except for septic arthritis or joint line tenderness, is probably insignificant. Signs of ACJ disease, that's the only joint I rely on tenderness in the acromioclavicular joint. And lastly, all the four rotator cuff muscles need to be tested. And Dr. Prati Gupta showed excellent videos. But there is a little bit of ambiguity when you want to perform these tests. For supraspiratus, I would rely only on the empty can test. You don't need to bother about any other test. Infraspinatus, the resisted external rotation by elbow by side. For teres minor, I would again go back to the resisted external rotation elbow by side, along with horn blower sign. And subscapularis, I mainly rely on Napoleon belly press test because Gerber liftoff is too painful. Any patient with a cuff pathology is not able to reach the back because as soon as the patient takes the hand back, the bursa gets stretched and pain is induced. So you already know this. This is infraspinatus and this is the most important clinical sign to detect teres minor dysfunction is external rotation lag sign at 40 degrees so i do the strength testing this test at 40 degrees and also at neutral as dr prateek gupta showed at at zero degree it tells me about the infraspinatus at 40 degrees it tells me about the teres minor as well this is the belly press this is the bear hug, and this is the Gerber lift off. Now we come to the subscapularis. This little bit lift off test is the most sensitive and specific test. There is no doubt about that. It's just about the practical implication of this test because people find it very difficult, even in bursitis or cough disease, to reach their back and try to attempt this test because it's painful. This is one of the patients. She's got a subscapularis tear. As you see the MRI, she can't reach her back. Painful. She stops there. Where to do the lift off in this? And I would like you to concentrate on see how does she do the belly press. So ask the patient to press the tummy with hands and then ask her to bring the elbow forward so that wrist is straight. If the wrist is not straight, that's a positive sign of subscapularis insufficiency. So look at the wrist, whether the patient is able to bring the elbow in line with the wrist, yes or no. If the elbow stays behind the coronal plane of the body, then you can further grade this test. But this is the test I rely on. In patients who are able to reach the back, there is the lift off, which is the best test anyway. So this is the ER lag on the right side. Look at the face. She is doing it, but with pain. This is again an indication that it is not. She is a determined lady, but she is painful. She is unable. She is unable to lift. Unable to lift. See the flailness in her. She is not able to lift it properly. There is no question of strength testing in this situation. Atrophy, Shashank has already said, but I, I only... You have to look at the T1 weighted oblique sagittal cut where the scapula appears Y-shaped and this has to be the most lateral cut of the Y-shape, not the medial, the most lateral cut. As soon as you start, when you're going from lateral to medial, as soon as you start looking at the scapula, as soon as it appears Y, that the first cut, that cut should be looked at. Obviously, infraspinous atrophy but now there's a question for the postgraduates, and I won't tell the answer. Why it is visible in the infraspinatus and not in the supraspinatus? What to look for in X-ray? True AP view, shape of acromion. In, and I do it in neutral rotation. Somebody asked this question, what to the position of arm? I keep the arm in neutral rotation or in external rotation during the true AP view. Lateral view will tell me about the presence of spur. Axillary will tell me static anterior subluxation in cases of chronic tears. And Zenka view will tell me the AC joint pathology. So X-rays are very important. MRI or no MRI, I need to have the X-rays. 
Furthermore, it, during the presentation, I'll tell you, this is the progressive cuff disease. So a normal X-ray. But see, the cuff has been rubbing against the acromion. It has developed a sclerosis. There is a lateral spur, downslope, lateral downslope, not the big lianis, type 1, type 2, type 3, which is, which is in the scapular lateral plane, but this is a lateral flow. So critical, so the, in this case, the critical shoulder anger is increased so much because of this spur. Now, the lateral spur are more dangerous than the medial ones. You see the medial eyebrow as well in this case. And you see a little bit of AC joint uh, space narrowing, but then you need a proper Zenka view and compare it with the other side. So this is a progressive rotator cuff disease. See, the acromiohumeral distance is gone. Although this is not a true AP view, when I do the true AP view in this case, I might find evidence of arthritis even on the glenohumeral side. But this is acromial pathology. This is a grade four uh, Hamada stage. I would request you all to read the Hamada staging for this. With the X-ray itself, I can tell you that this cuff is not repairable. I will not try and attempt to, I will not even order an MRI for this. Even for this, I might not order an MRI, depending on the cuff weakness or strength. <clears throat> so we've covered this. So this is a partial tear, right? The articular side. I can see the top side of the supraspidus coming there, coming there, and forming there. And this is deltoid, because I see this subdeltoid bursa white thing there. I know the superior surface of the cuff is intact, and this is the mainly the junction of the musculotendinous which is gone. That denotes a complete tear. Tendon is retracted. It's not only retracted. I see the lamination of the tendon there, but I know the tendon still looks very good because it's dark. It's not hyper intense. But whatever you see in the AP view, and as Shashank emphasized time and again, you have to have the orthogonal views, even in the MRI. And this is the orthogonal view. So where do I see the cuff tear? The most lateral view of the sagittal cut. As soon as I go beyond the skin and deltoid, that's the cuff, the most lateral cut. In fact, the, if you see the five MRI images in the topmost of the film, I think the second or third uh, cut itself should reveal the rotator cuff because that's the beginning of the greater tuberosity and as I go medially this is the, the lowermost figure is the lateral cut from here I see the rotator cuff here here I rotator cuff here rotator cuff I start seeing some tendon there and start seeing some tendon here some tendon here and then tendon there under the acromion so the lateral sagittal oblique cut is an important now I'm coming to a little bit of management I just got only 10 minutes so I have to rush <clears throat> Per impingement, no surgery, only posterior capsular stretches, NSAIDs, subacromial infiltration, scapular stabilizing exercises, because the scapula is usually not riding properly on the thoracic wall, so I need to improve the scapular kinematics. Partial tear, bursal sided tears are more painful. They need surgery more often than the uh, articular sided tears. Articular sided tears, less than 50%. Width of the greater tuberosity, which is around 16 mm -hmm. to 17 millimeter. So, in less than 50 percent, you rehab more than 50 percent, you take them down and repair. So, this is this is one group which is rotated to cuff tendinitis and partial tears. Practically doesn't need surgery except for bursal tears. Now, there is group two, full thickness tears with risk of ir ir irreversible changes. Now, these are actual tears of any size acute on chronic tears with recent functional loss, small and medium-sized tears which have failed conservative treatment. Early intervention is needed in this group because they can sometimes rapidly deteriorate and progress to irreversible stage. So these are arthroscopic repair. I'm not going to, I'm not going to go through the videos, but just the static images that is how the impingement looks like. So the top is the acromion, undersurface of acromion. It is frayed. Otherwise, this is a shiny ligament and there is nothing wrong there. So this is a, an uh, undersurface of the acromion and the superior surface of the rotator cuff. Both are having kissing lesions by frayed, frayed cuff tissue, inflamed synovium around the acromion. This is an angry looking shoulder. This is impingement on both the acromial and the bursal side. 
I've taken the ligament down, and that's the spot. That's the original acromion. And that's the actually the eyebrow sign, the medial spur, which we need to take. And that's the underlying impinged cuff. That's the articular sided, smallest articular sided tear, which looks like this. Cable is intact. And that's the crescent shaped full thickness tear. And there it is a repaired full thickness retracted tear. <clears throat> that's a large tear. You see the articular cartilage. As soon as the articular cartilage finishes, when we go inside the joint, the cuff has to insert there. You cannot see anything yellow beyond the articular cartilage. If you see that, then you are looking at a partial tear. If you don't see anything, it's a complete tear. So I'm not going to go through the videos. They're not worth it for your time, but this is more, more important for you. <clears throat> so what is a massive cuff tear? Anything which is beyond five centimeters involves two or more tendons, coronal length and sagittal width of more than two centimeter in MRI. These are three versions, but basically very, very large retracted tears, which are both more than three, four centimeters in AP and medial lateral extension. And what is the irreparability? <clears throat> you must know this. Chronic pseudo paralysis without pain is irreparable, something has to be done with that. Static and dynamic anterior subluxation is irreparable. Positive drop arm sign, ER lag sign, and heart blow sign denote irreparability. AHI less than seven, this is debatable, but some people would say five, some people would say seven. Gautelier stage three and four, infraspinatus becomes irreparable, means the failure rate is too high to repair. You can do anything, but failure rates are too high. And we can actually attach a central tendon retraction to glenoid in these criteria, and these things will form signs of ir irreparability. So MRI is the investigation of choice. CT arthrogram if you can't do the MRI. Now, another definition, pseudoparalysis and pseudoparesis. Pseudoparalysis means no active elevation, instead shoulder shrug, and there is an anterior superior escape. Pseudoparesis means some active painful elevation, but less than 90 degrees. So problems to be solved are many in these scenarios. This is a complex topic. I don't want to go there, but one of the techniques arthroscopically we use is margin convergence and try to convert a big tear into a small tear, which we can repair to the bone single tear. But otherwise, there are many options. Just give me a sec, please. So more than 70 years of age, large massive tears, irreparable changes. We do partial repair, tendon transfers, graft patches, superior capsular reconstruction, subacromial balloon spacers, and reverse shoulder replacement. Sorry about that. My computer is just giving me a bit of nap. So this is a paper by Burkhardt, but you don't need to go there because papers are individual studies and you don't need to bother about these studies. And this is what you are thinking now. What do I do? So many options. Believe us, even shoulder surgeons think about that. Just remember one thing, that this is current concepts for irreparable posterior superior cuff tears, no evidence for complex and expensive procedures like superior capsular reconstruction, blah, blah, blah. 50% failure in short term in every procedure. So massive irreparable tears, sho reverse shoulder replacement gives predictable results. And you should know when not to repair and steer clear of the unpredictable options. Being aware and knowing how to do does not mean it will work. This is a true pseudoparalysis anterior superior escape and only one procedure will restore the balance and that's the reverse shoulder replacement. But then there are such patients if you see, the acromiohumeral distance is totally gone. Tendon is totally retracted to the glenoid. There is no cuff. Subscapularis is gone. Infraspinatus is totally atrophic and white. Subscapularis is black. Infraspinatus is white. No infraspinatus. 
But look at that. Look at our external rotation. So I would say focus on the patient. This is an algorithm which works well. Pain or disability not accepted. Patient insists for something to be done. You find tear is repairable. Functional demands are high. Go and repair. We think functional demands low. You can still give steroid injection. And if patient still comes back, you can repair. If you think tear is irreparable, functional demands are high. Pseudo paralysis or external rotation loss do a reverse shoulder replacement. Functional demands low. Again, palliative procedures like steroid injection and biceps to not. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Raman Kang. I request Dr. Maheshwari to be ready with this presentation. Dr. Raman Kang, yeah. uh, there is the two questions from the audience. Yeah, yeah. What is the difference between degenerative rotator cuff tear and rotator cuff arthropathy? Arthropathy is degenerative. Dr. Raman, share out. Dr. Arthropathy Raman, is share. When share, uh, just uh, uh, you close your PPT. Stop, stop, stop sharing. sharing. Stop sharing. Stop sharing. Yeah. Okay, so rotator cuff tear arthropathy is when there is arthritis because of the rotator cuff tear. Okay. Because and the rotator cuff is torn, the upward pull of deltoid keeps on producing shearing forces. So 10% of rotator cuff tears develop rotator cuff tear arthropathy. Okay. And when do you do arthroscopic repair and when do you do open repair for rotator cuff tear? Uh, well, I I almost do arthroscopy repairs all the time now, but uh, when I started, uh, I used to do a mini open, but I have stopped doing that because uh, it becomes easier for me arthroscopically. So I do arthroscopic repair all the time. Okay, uh, Doctor Maheshwari, uh, can you go ahead with your presentation? Please, we'll Manish, take can I, yeah, Manish, yeah, sure. Can I sure. please, if you may allow? Yeah. Yes. What question, uh, please? Uh, 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 no, not the question. I think he, he has done it and covered it very uh, eloquently. Just a message for PGs. Um, Raman is a established shoulder surgeon and he has all the options available for massive irreparable cuff tears. Uh, please keep in mind that reverse shoulder arthroplasty is one of the options for massive cuff tears. Though examiners don't like to listen in the exam, you do. And what happens usually is when you have a cuff tear and you've heard of reverse shoulder arthroplasty by Raman, the first thing that comes out of your mind, out of your mouth in the exam is reverse shoulder arthroplasty. Only for pseudo paralysis. And I, I, I totally get it. What you're saying is Only totally right. Uh, just want to emphasize to, to uh, students in the exam. Uh, only when the examiner really okay there's anything else you would like to do there is anything else you would like to do then only mention the reverse shoulder arthroplasty for a massive shoulder tears irreparable tears uh, be a little conservative about mentioning shoulder arth reverse arthroplasty in the exam it is a very valid option it is one of the options we all uh, believe in but for exam there are a different set of answers you need to give uh, you should be aware of it no doubt about it can i start Yes, please. Yes, sir. You can start. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Right. Sir, you are. I am I'm sure it is at the end of the day and it has been very long two-hour session on something like shoulder. It must be very, very tiring. So I will just make it brief and simple, hopefully. Again, topic of shoulder arthroplasty is more theoretical for a postgraduate, but some ideas about the language that we generally talk. So the joint replacement scenario has been like this. In 80s, it was hip replacement, which was inherently a stable construct. Just put the socket, put the ball. Once it is gone in, more often than not, it will work whatever way the socket and ball may have been. So very, very forgiving. Mobility was there in all direction, but not that much, limited mobility. So basically, it is a very friendly joint for beginning orthopedic surgeons. That's why most people can do hip replacement very, very easily. How about knee replacement? It came in 90s, a little more tricky because not a stable joint like ball and socket here. The mobility was only in flexion extension. That is a grace. It was not very, very unstable joint. 
but we knew that we can make this joint stable in this one particular direction by adding something. For example, putting some kind of constraints. So it's stabilized. The knee replacement has stabilized, hip replacement has more or less stabilized, and now is the common surgery done as far as joint replacement is concerned is shoulder replacement. It is inherent, no inherent stability. It is flat on one side and round on one side. Everything has to be held properly by way of soft tissue balance, by way of muscular balance, by way of alignment. Otherwise, the shoulder is waiting to dislocate anytime. On the top of it, we need a lot of mobility. That is the function of the shoulder. Even if it is stable, and it cannot move in all direction, that shoulder arthroplasty is a failure. That's why shoulder arthroplasty is very tricky. It, you have to have a very good balance of stability as well as mobility. You want dono atme laddu. So how has shoulder replacement evolved? Let me quickly go through to make you understand why we are doing what we are doing. This was the first generation, what called monoblock. It had a round head of the humerus there. This will go into the uh, humerus shaft, and this was just one piece. It was mostly used for trauma, more or less like a spacer. Remove the chura of you know the multiple pieces of the upper head of humerus, just shove it in with cement, without cement. It used to mostly act like a spacer, not much function. And we very quickly realized that this one piece cannot do everywhere, so it has to be a second generation, which means they detach the head and the shaft like this. So you can put the shaft in, then you can put head the kind you like. It can be different sizes, it can be different width, and you can try to be a little bit smarter about balancing the shoulder better because now you have a choice of doing something during surgery on the table. That was second generation. Again, it worked better than first generation, but there were problems. Till this new very dynamic concept came about 20 years back, what is called third generation of anatomical processes. Now, this is what one has to understand. This is where we are today. So shoulder is not like a lollipop that there is a humerus and there is a thing sitting on the top of the humerus like this. It's not like that. It has different inclination, tilted like this, retroversion, offset, and head size. Now, these four things vary at the upper end of the humerus from patient to patient. And variation is really wide. That's why if you put one size in every patient, it doesn't work. It either loses on stability or loses on control or loses on you know uh, pain relief. Something happens if everything is not matched. That's why today's anatomical processes, which takes care of all these four aspects, it replaces what you remove and the way it was. You have to remove whatever was there in the body and remove it the way it was for that particular person. That is the trick. That is the problem why a shoulder replacement is a little bit more difficult surgery because you have to match with that patient, everything. And from this understanding started the journey of success of shoulder arthroplasty and that's what we are traveling. Let me right in the beginning tell about the basic indications. As per books, primary osteoarthritis is the most common indication of replacing the shoulder. Rheumatoid becomes another one, then fractures and rarely avascular necrosis and cuff tear arthropathy. Unfortunately, in our country, I think fractures are almost equal, if not more than even primary osteoarthritis, because our old people accept everything. All these category of people have no problem, even if they're handicapped, their family support, blah, blah, blah. But fracture is something devastating, particularly even in young people of 50, 60 years of age. That's where most often shoulder replacement is done in this country, which is different from most of the other countries, where Aging population and osteo and rheumatoid are more common. How about non-orthoplasty option? One has always to think about these options before you even talk about orthoplasty. You can give steroid injection like in any other uh, osteoarthritic shoulder. Hyaluronidase has no role in my practice, nowhere, not even in the knee and definitely not in the shoulder. Physiotherapy can be done, but I've seen n number of patients where physiotherapy makes it worse. So very often these patients are erroneously treated as frozen shoulder. Patient goes for physiotherapy. Oh, doctor, physiotherapy ke baat to aur bhi kharab ho gaya. Dard aur bhi bad gaya. And that raises an alarm that something is wrong. And arthroscopic surgery can be tried in selected cases. 
If this doesn't work, then you come down to shoulder replacement. So what are the types of shoulder replacements? In the PG class, I'll keep it very basic. There are two types, basically anatomical and reverse. And I'll come to what it means. Anatomical means the way our anatomy is. You have a socket and you have a ball, like the shoulder is. It is like that. You replace the socket, replace the ball. That is called anatomical shoulder arthroplasty, the way natural body is. You can do it hemi, which means remove only the part, upper part of the humerus and replace it with the ball. Now that can be done in three different ways. First is called resurfacing, where you don't even remove the ball of the head. You just grind it, resurface it, ream it, and put a kind of a cap. That is called resurfacing. Now the similar to the, the cousin of resurfacing is what is called stemless hemi, where you remove the head part, just chop it off. The upper humerus is as it is, just chop off the ball part of the head and put a artificial thing. So this is just reaming and capping more or less. Head is still there. In this, there is no head. Just chop off the head, put an artificial head on top of that cut portion. The next is stemmed hemi, which means once you remove the head, don't just put the head on top of the cut portion, ream into the medullary canal, and this head carries a stem with it. So most of the fixation goes through the stem. So these are three different types of hemiarthroplasty. You're only replacing or doing something to the upper end of the humerus and nothing to the glenoid. That's why it is called hemiarthroplasty. If you do total shoulder replacement, which means you replace the glenoid as well as the head of the humerus, it is called total shoulder replacement. You are replacing both the components. Now, this can again be stemless, which means you are, which means you are, uh, it is a stemless thing. You are replacing that either of these three methods, most commonly this and sometimes this, this hardly ever, but you are only replacing the head without using the stem. Or you can do a stem, total shoulder, something like this, where you put a stem, put a head and also replace the glenoid. So in anatomical way, either partial or full, if partial, these are three types, if full, these are the two types. Then we come to reverse shoulder and I'll come to that what it means. It's a very funny concept and I'm sure or some of the postgraduate youngsters, it may not be very clear what it means. And then there's an in-between called platform stem where you can put a stem in the medullary cavernal and on top of the stem, you can put either of these two. You can do a anatomical as well as reverse. That, that stem works for both. So that is another new development that you can use a platform stem depending on what you want to do on the table. This is an example of the type of shoulder processes available. This is resurfacing, it's just a cap on top of the head. Head has not been removed. Now here the head has been removed and we have replaced it with a ball with a stem. In the stemless, it is only this part. There's no stem here, only this part is replaced. And this is hemi because nothing has been done to glenoid, nothing has been done to glenoid here. This is a total shoulder replacement where you can see these two white dots show that the plastic is there, which is not visible on the X-ray, but the glenoid is replaced by a kind of a you know, shallow uh, plastic sheet, which is called glenoid prosthesis. And on the humerus side, you replace the humerus with a stemmed implant. This is what is called reverse shoulder replacement, where you reversed everything. Why it is called reverse? Because the humerus head or so-called ball has come to the glenoid side and the cup has come to the humerus side. So as against this, where the ball is on the humerus side, in this, the ball is on the glenoid side. That's why it is called reverse. And there's a very nice kind of logic and biomechanical logic of doing this rather funny, stupid looking operation. But it is one of the most successful and a favorite operation. These It's like putting somebody upside down and it still it works. So what is a reverse shoulder? I would just like to give a little idea about that. And for this, you have to understand biomechanics of the shoulder joint. A little bit. I'll not go into too much detail. The basic biomechanics of the shoulder is this. The head has to be centered on the glenoid by something and then only your deltoid etc can work. It's called force couple. One part of the muscles which are rotator cuff muscles will put the head back to the glenoid, hold it there, kind of compress it there and then only these other muscles can lift it. If these muscles are not there, these muscles cannot produce the movement that we want to do. <coughs> and I'll give you this example. If this guy is to lift this stair from there, he has to lift it. Unless he supports it on his leg here, from his feet, 
he cannot put force this and it will never lift if he removes his foot from air and he tries to lift that this thing the cd will come on this side so if you want to produce this movement there has to be a control from here that it means stabilizing and then the power working it is something similar that happens in the shoulder and that's how the normal shoulder replacement works that the you know the, the stabilizers are here the rotator cuff muscles and the deltoid is here as soon as the stabilizer compress this to the glenoid the deltoid can work and the shoulder movements happen now imagine a scenario when this cuff is not there for example the cuff is torn what will happen as i told you the deltoid will pull it up now this is going to happen once the cuff is torn and your deltoid contracts there is nothing to keep there is nothing to keep this head in the ground in the in the glenoid and the it will move up like this and you cannot have any movement it will be like lifting it up and down without any functional movement and that's what happens when there is a rotator cuff injury and what is called you know pseudo paralysis etc because there is no way this biomechanics of the shoulder is functioning and it cannot function so what do we do then you can do this you want to center the joint so you can have a glenoid with a extra support which will not let the head go that side that's a very simple logical option and if the head the head does not go there if this head does not move in that direction this deltoid will be functional because now the head is in the center place it is where it should be this shelf is doing the job of rotator cuff it's a very simple logical option but it doesn't work that way why because center of the location uh, rotation is here and when you do this all the force goes in this shelf and what it does is over a period of time by repeated hitting on the shelf it makes this loose so it did not work this method of was tried early in the beginning but it did not work with this glenoid will get loose very fast because this head is trying to support on this and as you know it cannot take the support the whole the implant bone junction will loosen up no 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 prop, no difficulty in understanding there because so much force all the force is going from here to here it will make it loose so the next idea came why not make some change that this is the part which gets loose the the the, the glenoid so called glenoid why not do something that the center of rotation is shifted here that means whenever you move the arm there is the center of rotation is right at the base of the glenoid that means there is no forces no shear forces on the glenoid and how can you do it it's not possible so the idea came why not reverse that means put this glenoid sphere here and now when this arm moves the center of rotation is here this is the arc on which it is moving but the center of rotation is here so the chances of this loosening at this glenoid or so called glenoid and bone junction have become less because there is no shear force at this center of location which was here because of a big arm as you know the liver how the liver works longer is the liver more is the force here now there is no liver here right at the base is the center of rotation so by changing the glenoid sphere like making it reverse it was a very intelligent move that even without a rotator cuff now this head can move around this glenoid sphere without creating any loosening here because the center of rotation is right there that's the philosophy of how reverse shoulder works now how long do the, do these last just for your knowledge there are n number of studies that shoulder replacement lasts more than 15 years in 90% of cases and even reverse lasts more than 10 years so we prefer reverse in anybody more than 65 70 minimum this can be done at earlier age because if it fails you can always do reverse in those cases but these are 10 to 15 years result operation these days and these are fairly old reports where in in 85% of cases these joint replacement have lasted for 15 years i am sure it is 20 years now so reverse or shoulder replacement is nearly as successful as any other replacement of the body we are just going there just the last slide how do you decide which shoulder replacement will you do in a particular patient the key deciding point as i told you is rotator cuff if cuff is okay or is repairable if it is not so there is no cuff it is not repairable you cannot do a anatomical shoulder you have to do a reverse shoulder so first thing that we examine is is the cuff okay if cuff is okay or is repairable then yes it is possible to do total shoulder we may not be able to requiring a reverse shoulder and then we decide the age of the patient 
if the age of the patient is less less than 70 glenoid is normal more or less and only head is not damaged you can do resurfacing it's just arthritis cartilage is gone but glenoid is reasonably okay head is reasonably not damaged you can do resurfacing you can do hemiarthroplasty stemless suppose the glenoid is okay but head is badly damaged then you cannot do resurfacing then you have to do hemi of some kind or even total replacement if the glenoid is not okay suppose the patient is older in that patient usually both are damaged head as well as glenoid and one would more often than not prefer doing a doing a total replacement or a hemi replacement depending on requirement of that person but if the head is damaged and the glenoid is also damaged more and more people are shifting in a 70 plus one operation which is very predictable is reverse shoulder replacement so reverse shoulder replacement sama has become so popular because its success rate is quite high that if person is more than 70 and there is any doubt about his rotator cuff any doubt about his shape of the glenoid any doubt about bone stock then one has a tendency to move to reverse but if the patient is active everything is fine you can also do total shoulder replacement i think that chart gives an idea about how do we decide about which one to do in which patient based on damage of the cuff based on age based on damage to the glenoid and also damage to the head on these four bases we can have this flow chart to understand which one is required in a particular patient thank you for your kind attention thank you dr maheshwari i request uh, dr uh, sumit to be ready with his presentation any question uh, for dr maheshwari till his uh, uh, dr sumit is preparing his ppt हेलो हाँ महेश्वर सर हेलो महेश्वर सर डॉक्टर विनीत है सर स्टूडेंट जस्ट वॉन्ट टू नो की इज एनी एब्सोलूट इंडिकेशन फॉर रिवर्स शोल्डर यस एब्सोलूट इंडिकेशन इज रोटेटर कफ डेफिशियंसी इफ रोटेटर कफ कैन नॉट बी इम्प्रूव बाई एनी मीन्स देर इज नो अदर रिप्लेसमेंट दैट यू कैन डू एक्सेप्ट रिवर्स शोल्डर रिप्लेसमेंट दैट इज दूट इंडिकेशन right right and okay. absolute contraindication absolute contraindication would be possibly the bone stock is very poor or deltoid palsy or deltoid is not working deltoid is not working so deltoid, deltoid not is working. the key key muscle for moving uh, reverse shoulder so deltoid is not working that would be absolute contraindication right sir thank you very much sir thank you bye bye okay and i think uh, there are couple of questions more but i think we uh, finish it off with dr sumit's presentation and then we take questions at that yeah that's okay dr sumit please you can so, start uh, am i audible yes yes you are audible you are, we are we can Good see your ppt also yeah all the students must be tired by now so i will briefly cover the basics of shoulder arthroscopy uh so this is the as you must be knowing that it is a second most common orthopedic procedure and the second to only knee uh, arthroscopic meniscectomies and uh, in comparison to the open ones it uh, gives comprehensive view of the intraarticular pathology and uh, it is uh, minimally invasive and has the potential for the rapid rehabilitation so i must i will be covering my talk under these heads to start with the indications of shoulder arthroscopy so all the students must be assisting their seniors for various indications so common beings are the rotator cuff tear labral tear and the subacromial impingement and the rare ones will be adhesive capsulitis proximal biceps pathology loose bodies and the degenerative arthritis so we will briefly cover the ot setup and the instruments so everyone must have seen all the basic uh, instruments that are available in uh, all the hospitals these are the special ones uh, especially designed for shoulder is a shoulder pump rf pro these are the arthroscopic burrs and the shaver blades so this is the arthroscopic probe wisinger rod also known as switching stick is a tissue liberator a similar instrument is the rasp a basket punch and the tissue grasper This is the arthroscopic knot pusher, arthroscopic knot cutter, suture manipulator, and crochet hook. So any of these instrument may be shown to you in your exam, and you may need to 
uh, identify those. So various sorts of cannulas are available. These are the fully threaded or the fully ribbed cannulas. These are the partially ribbed cannulas. Majority of the time, ribbed cannulas are used when uh, there is some intra-articular manipulation is there, or if the the surgery involves away from the joint, like in rotator cuff, these sorts of self-retaining cannulas may be required. So various suture passing instruments may be required, like this is the spectrum suture passing instrument is available for left and right side of the shoulder joint. This is the suture leaders where the oblong hole is there to lead the suture from the soft tissues. And these are the special suture passing instrument known as bird beak or arthropriors, especially if the rotator interval is short and uh, is narrow in cases of arthroscopic bank art repair and you intend to do the procedure with single anterior portal, this is a very valuable instrument. So this is a special instrument known as elite suture passer and is very much helpful for uh, arthroscopic uh, rotator cuff surgeries. And these are the various makes of different makes uh, like champion from the striker and true pass or the first pass from the Smith and Nephew. So from the this talk, this will be the three important uh, things that uh, every postgraduate student must be aware of and uh, to start with uh, one must learn the proper positioning of the patient in the OT setup. So two common positions that uh, uh, you must have seen are the modified lateral position and the beach chair position. Initially surgeons used to use this dead lateral sort of lateral position where they used to have problems with the anterior access to the joint. So a modified lateral position was uh, invented and uh, uh, it is a sort of floppy lateral position where 30 to 40 degree modified lateral patient is placed so that the glenoid axis is placed parallel to the floor. And uh, when the surgeon would have uh, ample space anteriorly for the instrumentation. So this is the OT setup for the modified lateral position where the traction has been applied and uh, apart from traction, there is a little bit of forward flexion. Apart from traction, uh, some sort of lateral, lateral sling traction may be applied to distend the joint, especially if the shoulder pump facility is not available. This is another position which is called beach chair position. The patient is seated in this position under anesthesia and a bolster is placed in the scapular region. And one must ensure that the acromion is uh, approximately parallel to the ground. So the operated limb may be held by the assistant or special holding devices like McConnell, Spider, or Trimanos are available in various setups. So one must be aware of various advantages and disadvantages of each one of these positions. But uh, it is a matter of patient, uh, is a matter of surgeon's preference and uh, your learning uh, in which hospital you are working, whichever position you have you are comfortable with and you have learned the position you have the orientation with you must use in your clinical practice however there are certain discrete advantages and disadvantages of each one of these procedures uh, for example uh, the traction may be applied in lateral decubitus position and it increases the uh, joint space and accentuates the liberal tears right However, beach chair position is considered to be upright position and it is anatomical in comparison to the non-anatomical orientation of the lateral decubitus position. So, however, the beach chair position has certainly got this major drawback in the terms of uh, hypotension or bradycardia leading to cerebral hypoperfusion. So one must be very much aware of this sort of disadvantage and which is not there with the lateral decubitus position. So if the patient is being planned for shoulder arthroscopy under regional anesthesia, the patient is not likely to tolerate this procedure in lateral decubitus when uh, beach chair will be preferred. So if one is using traction uh, in lateral decubitus position, traction is being used, one should be cautious about the possibility of neurovascular injuries and the possibilities of slight misplacement of the usual anatomical landmarks. So the next important point is uh, portal placement that uh, every postgraduate student should be aware of. Uh, for that, one must be aware of the surface landmarks or the anatomy. This is the first and foremost uh, before making any portal. 
but apart from this uh, proper anatomy knowledge one must be aware of the proper proper working angle intended for uh, required for some that procedure right so if you are using a correct surface landmark and making the putting the cannula in a wrong working angle uh, you are likely to have problems and difficulty in performing the surgery so you need to be uh, good in uh, using a proper working angle of the cannula so one must use some sort of spinal needle or iv cannula needle for this placement so these are the general anatomical consideration before making any portal so as far as anterior part is concerned uh, one must remain lateral to the tip of coracoid process because to avoid any sort of neurovascular injuries uh, like brachial plexus and axillary artery is lying inferior medial to that likewise inferiorly one must stay up and away from the 6 o'clock position likewise for the medial side at the base of the scapular spine one must be careful with the navigator portal into the joint so the further uh, uh, few slides uh, we will use a common term that is known as rotator interval and many a times post graduate uh, students are not aware of this term and they got confused while the talk is being given so this is the anatomical when the when you are doing some dissection sort of thing in cadaver so anatomically the rotator interval is called when the it is bounded superiorly by the anterior uh, border of the supraspinatus inferiorly by the superior border of the subscapularis muscle and base is formed by the uh, base of the coracoid process medially however if you see arthroscopic images majority of the time for practical purposes superiorly you can see a long head of biceps and inferiorly you see the upper border of the subscapularis muscle and base is formed by the anterior glenoid margin during the arthroscopy so the star is showing the place of arthroscopic rotator interval these are the various portals and uh, post graduate student should not be uh, should not get confused with uh, so many portals and they should rather focus on horse work horse portals that are number one this is the posterior portal these are the anterior portals and these are the lateral position lateral portals and the location of the lateral po portal majority of the time is uh, determined by the intended procedure there are few unusual portals like uh, this this is the navigator portal and uh, like this this is a, a portal of wilmington but uh, they should not uh, be confused with so many portals and they rather should uh, focus on work horse portals so this is the superior view of how the shoulder looks during the arthroscopy part this is the acromion and this is the clavicle and this is the coracoid portion this is the work horse portal posteriorly these are the lateral ones and these are the anterior ones so how are you this is the most important uh, portal in shoulder arthroscopy because the scope is uh, inserted through this portal and uh, uh, viewing portal is this only so it is very important you place this portal at a correct uh, location which is the 2 to 3 cm inferior and 1 to 2 cm medial to the posterolateral corner of the acromion and it passes through the belly of the infraspinatus majority of the time right so one must be aware of uh, the structures like a posterior humeral circumflex artery and the axillary nerve which lies 7 to 8 cm inferior to the posterior border of the acromion so while placing the 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 skin incision is placed at the area which is described here and a blunt tip uh, singer rod is placed inside in the direction of ipsilateral coracoid process so a pg student will majority of the time falter or will be scared of progressing ahead so it is a common learning that can be told just now that if the if the pg student is pointing the tip of the wisinger rod to some bony structure uh, Uh, he can ask his assistant to rotate the arm internally and externally if the tip of the uh, finger rod is palpating the rotations then probably the tip is there on the humeral head side and if it is not palpating any movement then it is probably on the glenoid side and the likely uh, point of entry inside the capsule will be somewhere in between that 
So likewise, the anterior portals, they are located one to two centimeter inferomedial to the anterior lateral acromion border and in just in front of the laterally over the coracoid process. One must not go beneath it or medial to it because the musculocutaneous nerve is located three centimeter inferior and just medial to the tip of the coracoid process. So there are two methods of making anterior portal. One is outside in technique and other is inside out technique. So this is the most preferred technique, which is known as outside in technique. Uh, a spinal needle is introduced at the intended entry point and uh, its trajectory inside the joint is uh, seen and it must uh, enter inside the joint just above the upper border of the subscapularis muscle and a beautiful rotator interval is depicted here. Few surgeons are there who prefer inside out technique where they, the camera is, uh, the scope is advanced to the intended uh, anterior portal and the scope is withdrawn and a Wissinger rod is advanced through this uh, sleeve and uh, here the established uh, portal is secured by uh, cannula and uh, the Wissinger rod may be switched with the scope to look for. Majority of the surgeon prefer outside in technique because it is more reliable and safe. So a lateral portal, uh, one must be aware of the lateral orientation line. This is the clavicle, this is the scapula, and this is the acromioclavicular joint line. So at the posterior border of the acromioclavicular joint line, if we draw a tangential towards the lateral side, this is known as lateral orientation line. And the lateral portion, lateral portal majority of the time will lie somewhere in this. And two to three centimeter distal to the lateral border of the acromia, this is made. At times, we may need to convert the arthroscopic procedure into mini open one. So the same uh, incision may be utilized for the same. Axillary nerve is located five centimeter beyond the acromion, so one must be very careful about. So now the important another thing is the things to be seen in the diagnostic round of the shoulder and all the PG should pay special attention to this because unless they know all the structures, they are likely to miss some arthroscopic finding which may hamper the result later on. So a diagnostic round is based on the two circle approach based on the Southern California Orthopedic Institute and uh, first circle is comprised of glenoid aspect and the other circle is comprised of humeral aspect. So glenoid aspect of the joint is examined using the first nine positions and the humeral aspect of the joint is examined from the position number 10 to 13. 14 is reserved for subacromial space. So I am uh, attaching figures, representative figures from the each position and postgraduate students must pay attention to this. The position number one is uh, meant for superior labrum and the biceps attachment for to see any tear instability or the slap so this is the superior labrum, this is the glenoid. You can see a cannula inside the joint through the anterior portal. And this is a long head of biceps attaching here. Position number two is meant for the long head of the biceps tendon. One must probe it to look for any pathology or the subluxation. So a probe is seen um, to check the mobility of the lateral head of the biceps. Position number three is meant for superior glenohumeral ligament. And one must be aware of all the possible anatomical variations of this ligament. It is seen just uh, below the long head of the biceps tendon here. And the position four is meant for middle glenohumeral ligament. And one must also be well versed with all the anatomical variations of the middle glenohumeral ligament. So this is a beautiful picture uh, of rotator interval and the subscapularis muscle is seen here. And uh, overlapping this is the middle glenohumeral ligament at times, there are a common uh, anatomical variation of the middle glenohumeral ligament is uh, the Buford complex in which uh, the anterior labrum is absent and middle glenohumeral ligament is uh, like a cord. So one must not confuse uh, this thing with uh, any other structure. Uh, position number five is meant for subscapularis um, uh, tendon. So here, the subscapularis tendon is uh, marked here for you to depict. Uh, if one is having some difficulty in visualizing, so one uh, must uh, ask the assistant to internally and externally rotate the arm and uh, subscapularis muscle will be seen quite clearly. So there is another method to clearly see the subscapularis muscle is ask the assistant to posteriorly sublux the 
humeral head and during this movement the subscapularis will stand out quite nicely position number 6 is for the antero inferior labrum and antero inferior glenohumeral ligament pathologies like bankart lesion and the elsa lesion so here the anterior labrum is seen quite nicely attached to the glenoid rim and here this is seen detached from the rim depicting the bankart dr lesion. somit can you wrap up because we are falling short of time so i am just a two three yes. slides yeah I'm yeah back. sure sure right so position number 7 is meant for axillary pouch and uh, antero inferior and posterior near glenohumeral ligament this is the space uh, common space for the loose bodies so one must look out here eight is meant for posterior labrum bennett lesion and the reverse bankart lesion so this is the posterior labrum is seen one must be careful not to withdraw Uh, the scope too much, otherwise uh, it may fall out of the joint. Position number nine is the last thing for the glenoid side is the posterior superior labrum. And this is depicted here, and ten is meant for the, uh, the here the shoulder uh, the humerus head round starts. It is meant for the supraspinatus attachment to the greater tuberosity of the shoulder like this. So the position number eleven is there for the infraspinatus attachment to GT. And twelve is to see the bare area of the humerus. Bare area of the humerus is there in between the between the border of the articular surface and the joint capsule, whereas it must be differentiated by the hill sac lesion, which impinges onto the uh, articular cartilage as well. So these are the last two positions that one must be aware of. Thirteen is for the capsule to look for the adhesive capsulitis, fibrinous synovitis, Hegel and reverse Hegel lesions. so the rotation of the arm is very much important to diagnose hegel and the reverse hegel lesions arthroscopically 14 position is meant for subacromial space so one should be able to see the inferior acromion coracoacromial ligament subacromial bursa and the rotator cuff here the shaver blade is cleaning the subacromial bursa and the rotator cuff will be depicted just below this so few of the risk i have already uh, talked about in the talk and because of the we are falling short of the time so i conclude my talk here if there is any question uh, please let me know thank you dr sumit for such a nice presentation uh, we have 5 uh, or 7 minutes to take uh, question so uh, is open is a open house now any faculty uh, can ask question in between themselves and i will uh, see that uh, what are the audience questions so you can start dr vineet are you there dr vineet dr basin basin sahab is left hand can we have the scapular view how to take it yes yes Doctor, Doctor Shashank. I have noted to the Doctor Vinay was mute. Shashank sir. Yes. Lalit sir has one question for you. Ki yeah. How to uh, how to take the scapular Y view for the position okay. for that? Okay. So can I share the screen? With yes. Permission from the moderator. Okay. Uh, I kept it ready. So uh, what? First, uh, let me show you. I think another. I think Lalit only or. Asked one thing: How to know if it's a good bilateral view? Is that what one one question was? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lale. Yeah. Okay. So that is one. Um, how exactly a Y view looks like? Just. So I I did cover it, but what you need why it is called Y view is because the scapula makes a Y. There, this is the body of the scapula. This is the end. The posterior border this is the anterior border so you must see an upright body of the scapula with anterior and posterior cortex this is the spine of the scapula and this is the acromion in a well done view about 20% of the acromion should be at the level of the spine or behind it whereas the about rest of the acromion is in front of the spine of the scapula then this many times if you when you get a y view done you will see this thing encroaching here oh, that's yes. not that's not because the ac joint is disrupted but that is because it's not the angle of the beam is not done is not proper and i'm going to show you how to take that view so the acromion and clavicular joint should be 
clearly visible here in the wide view. And then this is the space, and then you can see the big, different types of Bigliani, uh, Acromion, so on and so one, two, and three. So to 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 uh, classify Bigliani uh, Acromion, you need this view to see whether it's the type one, two, or three. Is that okay? Is everybody any questions regarding this? How a good wide view looks like? Yeah. Yeah, that's good. No. We need to know the position, how to keep the limb and what is the position of machine. That's yes, right. I'm going there. Okay, now let's go to the video. So number one thing is you must must do the you must mark the spine of the scapula. So that will tell you the, the spine of the scapula. You just make a mark with the pen initially where the spine of the scapula is. After that. Turn the beam about 18 to 20 degrees cordon. And then the position of the patient is exactly opposite to the AP view. If you remember what I told about AP view, it is a, the patient is standing facing the beam. In this, the patient is standing with his back towards the beam about making about 30 to 40 degree angle to the cassette. Let's see this, how this happens. So beam about 18 to 20 degrees going down, patient with his back towards the beam and making about 30 degrees from the cassette. Let's see. We can't see the video. Sir, we can't, oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, okay, okay, wait. wait it's wait. not running. <laughs> it's not, it's not running. Just a minute. Shashank, did you place this video in the PPT? Yes, yes. Uh, because it will work only in the PPT. Oh, okay. Hey, just a you minute. Cannot play, you cannot play the video separately, so you have to put it in the PPT. Okay, you can't see it yes, now, yes. right? Oh, now we can see, we can see. Okay, let me, let, me, let me start it from the right from the beginning. Can you see it now? Yeah. So about 20 degrees of caudal angle of the beam. That is the cassette hair. Patient standing with his back towards the beam. This is the spine of the scapula. The beam is coming, this line is made so that the, the, the X-ray beam is coming in the line of the scapula. And he's making about 30 to 40 degree angle with the cassette. Was that clear? Any questions? Doctor, Professor Mary, was clear, sir. okay? Yeah, it's fine. I think the PGs need to practice this. Only then they will uh, understand. Okay. okay. That's Dr. That's Prateek, really right. Dr. Prateek, are you around? Dr. Prateek, sir, stop Gupta? sharing your video. Yes, I am there. Uh, there is a question for you that how do you test? Uh, what are the tests for slap region? Slap lesion, uh, basically, essentially, you test uh, as for the biceps. You do the same thing. You do what we'll call as O'Brien's test. In the O'Brien's test, you uh, forward flex the shoulder and adduct it by 20 degrees, just like you do for uh, um, uh, supraspinatus, you do for the empty test and test. The same level of the shoulder, but it is adducted like so, if you can see my hand, about 20 degrees. And at that stage, you do the same thing as you do for uh, empty can test. You press it down. And if there is pain wow. elicited, uh, that shows uh, that uh, there is a uh, uh, possibility of slap lesion. Then you also do biceps test, obviously, along with it. But this is one of the commonest tests that is done for a slap lesion. Okay. Okay. It's called O'Brien's test. Yeah. Any questions from the faculty? To any speaker, I think okay. I think we need to wrap up. Yes. Now you we need to wrap up, Doctor Shamshul. Sir, Doctor yes, Shamshul, are you yes, around? Sir. Yes, sir. I'm here, sir. So I'll take uh, last few comments from Doctor Sharad. Before that, I will thank Doctor Shamshul and Doctor Ashok Sham for giving this opportunity for such a nice webinar, such an elaborate webinar that 
almost three hours. People have studied shoulder, so I think there should be no problem in passing exams now. Dr. Sharad, your last comments. And thank you, Dr. Manish. On behalf of Delhi Orthopedic Association, I thank the eminent faculty for covering the subject of shoulder so lucidly, keeping in mind the requirements of postgraduate learning. As I said in the beginning, not only the postgraduates, it was a LD revision for all of us. Uh, professor, Ma Professor Manny, any uh, uh, right. want to share any thoughts, Dr. Professor Manny? Just, just let me complete. Just one more line. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. My sincere thanks to all delegates who joined the webinar and made it a success. Finally, my thanks again to Dr. Manish, Dr. Uh, Shamsul Hoda, and Dr. Shyam uh, from Ortho TV for working hard to make the this visible. Thank you, Dr. Lalit Manny. Dr. Lalit Manny, can you hear us? This net is not working, sir. Manny, sir. Net is not. Dr. Lalit Manny. I think he cannot hear us. So I thank the whole faculty and uh, it was a very uh, success. But you know what has happened that people are getting exhausted of, exhausted of uh, webinars. So, yeah, and uh, actually spine and hip are more popular than shoulder. So our attendance is not matching uh, spine and uh, hip joint, but I think Lalit is back. Lalit, Professor Lalit, Manny. Dr. Manny. I think he's not there. No problem. But, so, uh, 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 Manish, you see, the, as Dr. Maheshwari also said, shoulder it is not that many people are still into, and it is kind of gradually getting into the people's, uh, you know, liking as compared to spine and other thing where there's a lot of interest. So I think if you see any um, conference or any uh, meeting of shoulder, the strengths can never match the other ones because of the limited area of, uh, you know, uh, interest of the faculty as well as of the delegates. Okay, I think Professor Manny is back. Can you hear us, Dr. Manny? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I wanted your last comment from you. You being the teacher oh. at Malana Zad. Yeah. Are we still live? Yes, sir. Yes. We are live. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, so, shoulder is not a very popular uh, case in exam because the PGs have been thinking it will not come in the exam. The common cases which come is uh, maybe a strangled shoulder or a post-infective sequelae. But now as things are changing, you know, painful and uh, uh, different type of shoulder cases have started coming in DNB. So I think it is high time that students start learning the special test and uh, also start looking into the interesting in those things because there are uh, viva tables which now have MRIs in them. So please start reading shoulder, the special test, and please start reading the Ideology and more serious. Okay, thank you, Professor Manny. So we wrap up now. Thanks, Dr. Shamshul Huda, Dr. Ravi Chohan, and uh, Dr. Ashok Shah. Thank, thank you, sir, everyone. Much. Bye. Have a good thank night. Sir, for a Take care. Webinar, sir. Bye. 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 Bye.